No, no. Yes. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Afternoon and welcome. We're going to come to order. Uh, welcome to the uh, May the 9th, 2017 convening of the Baltimore City Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. Uh, a few house rules before we get underway. First, uh, if you have a cell phone, a pager, anything that makes any kind of audibly, audible, electronically generated sound, plays a ringtone, a chime, etc., we please ask uh, that at a minimum you uh, turn those devices to a vibrate only, if not off, position. Uh, similarly, to the extent that you need to have a conversation with someone, we ask that you please take that conversation out the double doors to your rear. The reason for those rules is pretty simple and straightforward. You'll note that there are a number of microphones which are arrayed around us up here, and those microphones are all very sensitive. Uh, they are on and they are not only for the purpose of, uh, uh, for, uh, for amplification, but also for the purpose of recording these proceedings and cell phones, pagers, conversations, and the like. Don't just interrupt the general conduct of these proceedings, but also interrupt the recording of these proceedings as well. In, in addition, uh, those of you who are forward of the wall above you, if you turn and see, you can see that there are one, two, three video cameras which are mounted on the wall there behind you. There are one, two video cameras uh, mounted up here on the wall behind us. Um, these proceedings are being streamed live on the website, I believe, for the city's cable access network, stored on, for uh, later viewing on the city's YouTube channel, and uh, videoed for subsequent broadcast on the city's cable access network. It comes on after Wayne's World. Um, so uh, uh, conversations, cell phones and the like also interrupt uh, that uh, videotaping process as well. Um, we are going to be voting at the end of the day and you're certainly more than welcome to hang around and enjoy a civics lesson if you so choose. But if you have other things to do on this otherwise splendid early spring afternoon, that's quite understandable and you can call into the zoning board office in the morning and find out how we ruled in your case. If you take out pen and paper, I'll read this number off a couple of times. Uh, this is the number uh, for the zoning board office and you can call there uh, in the morning to find out how we ruled in your case. That number is 410-396-4301. Again, 410 three nine six four three zero one you will however need to wait until you receive the formal written notice of the outcome of your case that should be forthcoming in about three to four weeks before you will be able to uh, obtain your permit um, uh, and we certainly ask that you please uh, uh, not build in the city of Baltimore without first obtaining all of your uh, proper necessary permits uh, if you haven't <coughs> already done so if you're here in opposition to any case today we ask that you please sign in on our signing sheet being held up now by Mr. French. Um, the signing sheet allows us generally to know um, which cases have opposition, but also allows us to know who needs to receive those aforementioned written notices I just uh, was talking about. Um, so if you are in opposition to any case today, please make sure that you are signed in so that we uh, know um, how to find you uh, as far as sending you notices in the case. Additionally, there are a couple of matters um, that have been either postponed or withdrawn, and then if, at least with regard to the postponed matters, um, uh, those cases won't be going forward today, but they will be going forward at a subsequent date. We need to know who you are and how to contact you um, uh, to let you know uh, if your case gets postponed, when it will be going forward again. Uh, the procedure, if you're the appellant, you will, uh, when your case is called, you'll come forward and you'll stand to our left or your right. The opposition, if any, will stand to our right or your left. Uh, once everyone is up here, we'll get you all sworn in and then we'll begin first with the appellant. We'll be given the opportunity to uh, discuss the issues in the case with us, uh, present any documents, testimony and the like they would like to offer in support of any arguments. Um, uh, they make on behalf of their appeal and to respond to any questions uh, which may be asked by the board. Uh, once they are concluded with their presentation, we'll then turn to the opposition, if any, who will be given the opportunity to present their documents, testimony, and argument um, in support of their positions as well. Uh, finally, once they've concluded, we'll go back to the appellant to respond to any points that were brought up by their opposition and then to offer a closing statement. We won't be going back and forth and back and forth unnecessarily delaying things any longer um, uh, than is needed. Um, 
The cases uh, today on the docket will be, gen be heard generally in the order in which they appear on our uh, docket uh, after we first dispense with some uh, preliminary issues. As I had mentioned before, there are uh, some cases which have been, I guess at this point, there's one postponed case um, and one case which has been uh, withdrawn. So these are cases which are not uh, going to be going forward today. Uh, 120, uh, 2017-126-2509 Garrett Avenue. That case has been postponed. And then 2017-157-1206 uh, Springfield Avenue. That case has been withdrawn. Uh, with uh, that case, that is uh, Springfield Avenue. I know that there is someone who signed in in opposition to that case, so you should take note of the fact that it, the appeal has been withdrawn uh, and won't be going forward. The case will only go forward, um, unlike a postponed matter. Um, withdrawn matter won't be going forward unless a appeal is uh, refiled for that property. Um, next are cases which appear on our consent agenda. And the consent agenda consists of cases where the zoning board staff has reviewed the board files in these uh, cases. And the board has determined that we have sufficient information to approve these appeals on a consent basis. Uh, I'm going to call all of the consent cases together as a group. Um, so as I read off uh, each case one by one, ask that you please come forward and then try to stay in the order in which you're called. Once everyone is up here, we'll then get you all sworn in. And we'll call each case in turn. You'll be given the opportunity at that point to offer any uh, information that you would like to have added to the record at that time. Uh, first case on the consent agenda is 2017-86-2027 uh, Maryland Avenue, Kim Barcella. Okay, what's your name? And the next case will be 2017-110, uh, 5101 through 5103 York Road, uh, Mohammed al -Ghanam. Next will be 2017-122, 1130 Inner Circle, Juan Valdez. You can line up on this side, sir. Um, no, we had someone who signed in in opposition to 2017-134. That's 2237 Essex Street. Who's here in opposition to that case? She may have left. We're going to postpone that until okay. next time. 135, she was okay with, so I'm okay. going to forward with that. Okay. Um, so 2017 135, 2239 Essex Street. Mr. Prettle, for the record, you are um, postponing uh, 134. Okay, we'll address that one. Okay. Okay. Um, 2017-136, 2750 through 2760 West North Avenue, Timothy Dwyer. Okay. 2017-138, Southeast Side of Paca Street, Southwest of Monroe Street, Caroline Hecker. 2017-139-606, Fulcroft Street, Caroline Hecker. 2017-140, 1300 through 1308 Russell Street, also Caroline Hecker. And 2017-141, 101 through 115 East Well Street, Caroline Hecker. 2017-144, 324 South Exeter Street, Ronald Barnes. 2017-147, 4502 Keswick Road. Frederick Bolton. 2017 158, 1634 North Calvert Street, Jason Neal. Finally, 2017 161, 1700 West 41st Street, Caroline Hecker. can ask all those who intend to give testimony to please raise their right hands and be sworn. I'll raise your right hands, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. 
All right, calling first consent case 2017-86-2027 Maryland Avenue, Kim Barcella. Hi, good afternoon. Afternoon, ma'am. Uh, we have this as an application to use uh, the premises as a yoga studio and four dwelling units. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Mr. French, is there anything you'd like to offer on behalf of the planning department? Thank you. Martin French for the Baltimore City Planning Department. Planning Department notes that this property is in the Charles North Urban Renewal Plan area, which and that plan does contain some specifications for any exterior modifications to the property. The Department of Planning recommends that approval of this application be subject to the condition that all exterior renovations to the existing structure on the property are completed in accordance with the guidelines and standards contained in the Charles North Urban Renewal Plan. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and Ms. Barcella, are those conditions stated by the Planning Department acceptable to you? Yes. Okay, and is there anything further you would like to uh, have added to the record at this time? No. All right, Zoning Board staff having uh, previously reviewed your application, we have determined that there is sufficient information to approve your appeal. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next, 2017-110, 5101 uh, through 5103 York Road, uh, Mohammed Adnam. Afternoon, sir. We have this application to add carry out to existing gas station with convenience store. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And Mr. French, anything on behalf of the planning department? Planning department has no objection to this application. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Elganam, is there anything further you would like to have added to the record at this time? No, thank you. All right. We understand that there is a, a memorandum of understanding with the community association in this case. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And Mr. Chairman, do we have that in our file? Yes. yes. Okay. And Mr. Elganam, you understand that the uh, memorandum, memorandum of understanding will be uh, included uh, and incorporated, or rather be incorporated into um, our rulings uh, as a part of this case? Yes. Okay. Uh, anything further? No, thank you. All right. Zoning Board staff, having previously reviewed your application, we have determined that there is sufficient information to approve the appeal. Thank you. Good luck. Good afternoon. Afternoon, sir. Yes. Um, we have this is 2017 122, 1130 Inner Circle, Juan Valdez. Yes. Okay. Mr. Valdez, we have this as an application to store a boat or slash boat trailer in the rear yard. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Mr. French, anything for the planning department? Thank you. Planning department noted this property is located within the Brooklyn Curtis Bay Strategic Neighborhood Action Plan area and notes that the zoning code requires specific conditions for approval of this appeal. And these conditions include, at no time will this equipment be used for living or housekeeping purposes. The equipment will not have fixed connections to electricity, water, gas, or sanitary sewer facilities. Except as specified in subsection B of this section, if the equipment is parked or stored outside of a garage, it will be parked or stored to the rear of the front building line of the lot and located at least three feet from the side or rear lot lines. The equipment will be kept in good repair and carry a current year's license and registration. The parking and storage is not of an unoccupied mobile home, being a movable or portable dwelling constructed to be towed on its own chassis and connected to utilities and designed without a permanent foundation for year-round living, which is specifically prohibited. An exception for loading and unloading provides that the equipment may be parked anywhere on the premises for a period of not more than 48 hours for loading or unloading purposes. Subject to these conditions, the department recommends approval of this application. Thank okay. you. And, sir, are those conditions stated by the planning department acceptable to your client? Yes. All right. And for the record, sir, your name is? Luis Vasquez. This is my president. Okay. Um, you're uh, here for the purpose of interpreting for Mr. Yeah, Valdez? Yeah, because mother's way, yeah. Okay. Um, have you previously discussed the conditions uh, okay. sought by the okay. planning department with him? Okay. Dice él que, que la condición que te dice papel este que está aquí, sí. tiene que cumplir con todas ellas, ok? Ok. Si, ¿Estás seguro que cumple con ella? Porque si no te voy a meter por tal, ok? Sí. ¿Está aprobado? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, he agrees with the conditions offered by the planning department. Okay. That's it. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, <laughs> that's so okay. okay. Uh, is there anything further you would like to offer to no. supplement the record in case? No. No. Okay. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed your application, we have determined that there is sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 2017 uh, 135, 2239 Essex Street, Nate Prettle. Good afternoon. Afternoon, Mr. Prettle. Uh, we have this an application to remove portion of second floor rear and construct a uh, rear deck, new third floor with penthouse and rooftop deck at this location. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Mr. French, anything on behalf of the planning department? Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Mr. Prettle, anything further you'd like to add uh, to supplement the record in this case? Just that we've had several meetings with the Ken Community Association and you have a letter 
uh, on their behalf in your file. Okay, um, we have that? Yes. All right. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed your application, we have determined that there is sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Um, calling 2017-134-2237 Essex Street. Mr. Predle, um, uh, this is your case, correct? That's correct. And you'd like uh, a postponement in this case? Yes, until May 23rd. All right. I think the woman has already left, but I'll yes. s still postpone. We're not going to go <laughs> forward. Yes, I understand that you to talk before the case, and I'm going to imagine you'll have sub subsequent discussions after that. Uh, anything further? No. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Next, 2017 136, 2750 through 2760 West North Avenue, Timothy Dwyer. Good afternoon. Afternoon, sir. We have this as an application to add 12 uh, panel antennas and one dish antenna to existing telecom towers. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Mr. French, anything for the planning department? Thank you. Planning department reviewed this application, noted that this property is not in an urban renewal area, and recommends approval of the application subject to these conditions. The antennas and related equipment must be mounted at the elevations shown on the plans prepared by the applicant to ensure they are visually unobtrusive. The panel antennas and related equipment will be mounted as illustrated in the plans and elevations submitted to planning, and the applicant will adequately mitigate any adverse effect as specified in the report of the Historical and Architectural Preservation Division of the Department of Planning in accordance with that report's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. And sir, are those conditions stated by the Planning Department acceptable to you? Yes. All right. And is there anything further you would like to add to the record at this no, time? thank you. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed the application, we have determined that there is sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Good luck. Next, 2017-138, southeast side of Paca Street, southwest of Monroe Street, Caroline Hacker. Good afternoon, Justin Williams, calling up Caroline Hacker from Rosemary Martin Greenberg. With me is Steve Ginsburg from Clear Channel Outdoor. Afternoon, uh, Mr. Williams. We have this as an application to replace two billboard faces to include a digital screen on south-facing sign is that correct yes that's correct all right mr french on behalf of the planning department thank you planning department has reviewed this application and recommends approval of the appeal with the following conditions that the entire face of the existing billboard or general advertising sign is approved for alteration to a digital screen and that this alteration may be installed in incremental steps at the appellant's option without further need for land use approval so long as the billboard adheres to the operational limits or other conditions that may be imposed by the board Second, that the performance of the digital screen billboard conforms to all the requirements of Section 11-502 of the Zoning Code by having a minimum dwell time of 10 seconds, that it will not increase the area of the existing billboard, that it will not increase the degree of illumination, and it will not have any flashing, blinking, fluctuating, or otherwise animated light. Third, that the digital screen billboard will not have animations, movie clips, and or sound elements. Fourth, that the digital screen will default to black entirely in the event of a failure of the remote control system or an interruption of advertising copy, text images or both. And finally, that the digital sign will have automatic brightness controls so that the sign will not constitute a hazard to passing motorists at night or during inclement weather. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Williams, are those conditions stated by the planning department acceptable to your client? They are, yes. All right. And is there anything further you'd like to add? A packet of exhibits in support of the appeal. All right. Anything further? No. All right. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed your application, we have determined that there is sufficient information to approve, to approve your appeal. Next, uh, we'll call two of these cases together, 2017-139-606 Fullcroft Street and 2017-141-101-115 through 115 East Wells Street. Uh, Mr. Williams, you're appearing for Ms. Hecker in, this case, in these cases as well? I am, and joined by Steve Ginsburg from Clear Channel. Afternoon again to you, sir. All right, and the description in the cases is the same, that is to replace two billboard faces to include a digital screen on north-facing sign. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Mr. French, anything on behalf of the Planning Department? Planning Department is recommending conditions identical to those just stated in the previous case. Okay. For brevity, and I'll state that. If you need them read out, I'm happy to read them out. <laughs> Mr. Williams, you need the conditions read back again? I do not. I'll be consent to the <laughs> All right. <laughs> and just for the record, you said that your client does accept to those conditions? Correct. All right, okay. That is, accepts those conditions. All right, anything further uh, you'd like to have uh, added to the record? I in support of the appeals in both cases. All right, pass those down. Is that it? Then one more case? Yes, yeah, for this case, yes. Okay. All right, zoning board staff, having previously reviewed the application, we have determined that there is information to approve your appeal. 
Next case, 2017-140, 1300 through 1308 Russell Street. Also Caroline Hecker, presumably Mr. Williams appearing for Ms. Hecker. Good afternoon, I'm joined by Steve Ginsburg from Clear Channel. <laughs> again, gentlemen. Um, we have this an, an application to replace two billboard faces with digital screens on both sides. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Mr. Franks, for the Planning Department. Again, the conditions recommended by the Planning Department for approval are those equivalent to Appeal Number 2017-138, previously okay. heard. And uh, Mr. Williams, is your client uh, accept those conditions with respect to this appeal? Yes. All right. Anything further you'd like to have added to the record? Exhibits for the record. Is that it? That is all. Okay. So, number of staff, having previously reviewed your application, we have determined that there is sufficient, sufficient information to approve the appeal. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck to you. Next, 2017-144, 324 South Exeter Street, Ronald Barnes. Good afternoon, Mr. Washington. Afternoon, sir. We have this as an application to construct third floor rear addition of this location. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Mr. French, anything for the Planning Department? Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. All right. And Mr. Barnes, anything further you would like to have added to the record in this case? Just that I'm uh, building a third floor addition and not increasing the footprint of the building at all. Okay. Not, uh, Is that it? Yes, sir. All right. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed your application, we have determined that there is sufficient information to approve your appeal. Very good. Thank good you, sir. To you, sir. Thank you. Next, 2017-147, 4502 Keswick Road, Frederick Bolton. Good afternoon. Afternoon, sir. Um, we have this application to install 11, uh, to install 11 feet of six foot high fence in a front yard. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Mr. French, for the planning department. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. All right. And Mr. Bolton, is there anything further you would like to add to stop on the record in this case? No. All right. Zoning so board staff, having previously reviewed your application, we have determined that there, that there is sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Good luck. Next, 2017-158, 1634 North Calvert Street, Jason Neal. Hello. Afternoon, sir. You're Mr. Neal? Yes, sir. Okay. Who do you have with you, Mr. Neal? This is Tom Williams, the owner of the property. Okay. Yeah. Afternoon, Mr. Williams. Uh, Mr. Neal, we have this an application to use uh, the premises as two dwelling units with two parking spaces and a rear yard. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Mr. French, anything on behalf of the Planning Department? Planning Department has reviewed this application and recommends approval. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Neal, anything further you would like to have added to the record in this case? No, sir. All right. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed your application, we have determined that there is sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you, sir. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Next, 2017-161, 1700 West 41st Street, Caroline Hecker. Good afternoon. Caroline Hecker. I'm joined by Adam Benish, who's the founder of Union Craft Brewing, which has the property under contract. Okay. This ought to be interesting. <laughs> um, good afternoon to you, sir. And Ms. Hecker, we have this application to use a portion of the premises for an indoor climbing gym. That is correct. It, they're planning to lease a portion of the premises to an indoor climbing gym. Um, so it won't be part of the brewery operation, but it will be within the same building. <laughs> no drinking and climbing. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, for our personal injury brethren standing there <laughs> handing out cards. We hope they'll come to the brewery yeah, after so they've yeah. finished climbing and not before. <laughs> Mr. French for the Planning Department. Planning Department has reviewed this application and has no objections. Thank you. Really? You don't want to have a condition? <laughs> <there? Okay. laughs> All right. Ms. Hecker, anything further you would like to have added? I do have some time. exhibits I'd like to add to supplement. And that's it? That's it. Okay. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed the application, we have determined that there is sufficient information to approve the appeal. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. All right. <clears throat> the remainder of our docket will consist of cases for which uh, opposition, well, will include cases uh, in which uh, opposition is signed in. And frequently we found that opposition is a result of either a lack of communication or miscommunication amongst the parties. And it can uh, frequently can be useful to, to offer the parties an opportunity to have a dialogue amongst themselves to see if they can't uh, resolve whatever differences they have. Um, uh, obviously, if uh, there are two opposing sides in a dispute and the parties ask the board to resolve that dispute, one of those two parties is bound to go away disappointed with the result. 
So this is your opportunity to avoid that unhappy fate. I'm going to call off the cases where opposition has signed in. Um, you can just stand where you are. We'll ask if there has been any dialogue between the parties um, and if the parties would like to either have one or continue uh, speaking uh, to see if they can't reach a resolution. You're certainly not uh, obligated to speak with one another, but we certainly do encourage and appreciate it. Um, first case, we've got opposition signed in the 2017-101, 17 North Chester Street, Travis Lockman. Okay. And have you folks spoken? Yes. Yes? Okay. Any resolution? Still opposed? Okay. Have a seat. We'll call you in turn. Um, I know the answer to this, but 2017-107, uh, 301 West 29th Street, Ms. Hecker? Yes. Any prospect of a resolution? Ms. Floyd? No. <laughs> okay. 2017 um, 129, 2700 through 2732 May Streets, Michael Burton. Okay. Have you folks spoken? Okay. Is there? Okay. Um, have a dialogue. When you're ready to go forward, just come back in and let us know. Uh, 2017-137, 823 South Linwood Avenue. Mr. Prettle. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Have you folks spoken? Yes. We have, and I would like to request a postponement. Um, I was not aware of some of these particular issues, and I'm here with the property owner, Travis Lockman from Trump City Builders. Mm -hmm. and we'd like the opportunity to revisit the plans in lieu of some of their comments. Mm -hmm. I understand that they may want to go forward today, but I think it would benefit us greatly to be able to take these into consideration to see if there's anything we can do to come uh, in two weeks and not have a contested hearing. Okay. We Sir? Just agree to a postponement. Um, we're at an impasse with, with uh, there is no solution. We've discussed it. I, I don't a know delay would agree, only be a hindrance to the people that have come here today. Uh, it sounds like they're saying that they're going to be redrawing the plans. We're going to look at it. They, there's an issue with the third floor that we're going to revisit to see if there's a way to make the project happen with either a reduced or no main floor. So I would respectfully request postponement for us to at least have a chance to consider that. Okay. I mean, it sounds like they're trying to accommodate your objections. No, our objection is, is only for the third floor, and they are trying to find a way to convince the clients that, my clients, that their third floor will not be a hindrance to them. There's no, they haven't stated anything about redrawing the plans with Okay, we'll go forward with it. <coughs> uh, if I say some, one more thing, there may be an option where we do not have a third floor. I can't promise it. Well, but then we would decide today that there's not going to be a third floor. I understand. I don't, with my client, we don't have the time within the next hour to see what that means in terms of their project. That's why I would like to see if anything's possible. And I don't know that it's that you know, uh, much of a hardship to at least give us a shot. We just found out about these, uh, this opposition. Okay. For the record, um, as far as um, anyone's attendance, um, you know, we convene again in two weeks, so the next date is 23rd the 23rd of May. If you're, I think you indicated, sir, that you have clients. Yes. Um, if you want to check with them to see what their schedules are on the 23rd, you can certainly can have that conversation. Um, to see if that's a date which accommodates them. I don't believe this case has been previously postponed, so we have our uh, traditional policy on postponements is that uh, they are at the discretion of the applicant to, uh, to request, um, and where it is a first um, postponement, uh, we have not denied those requests uh, uh, unless there is some kind of absolute um, pressing need to not um, uh, or need to have the case determined today as opposed to uh, on a subsequent day. Um, I understand that um, your clients uh, may have uh, come here in anticipation of, uh, uh, of today's hearing, that it would be going forward. Uh, it doesn't sound like there has been previous dialogue amongst the parties before today. Um, uh, so, you know, it's kind of unfortunate that there hasn't been that dialogue before today. Um, um, so, you know, if 
you know, again, if you folks can look at what dates you have uh, that are available, and if there are any, um, if anyone has an absolute scheduling, anyone who needs to be here um, and has an absolute um, scheduling conflict with the next hearing date, um, you can investigate other dates that may be available in the appellant's calendar um, if the 23rd doesn't work. Uh, alternatively, what we've also advised um, uh, frequently uh, uh, people who are in opposition to cases is that um, if they cannot be in attendance, they can submit their, um, uh, their uh, opposition uh, in the form of a written statement, which will then be read into the record having the same effect of, as their testimony um, in lieu of their actual presence. So if, they're, if the case gets, goes forward on the 23rd and there's someone who's not able to appear on the 23rd, they may, so long as they've submitted their written statement prior to that hearing, their concerns will be read into the record uh, as part of the appeal of that case at the outset when we do the staff reports. Um, so with that said, I will skip over you folks right now. Um, you can revisit it, we'll go through the rest of it, and then I'll call you back and see where things are. Okay? All right, thank you. Uh, don't go anywhere, Mr. Prettle, 2017-146. Oh, is that the same one? No, it's not. 2017-146-143 uh, West Randall Street. Yes. Is there opposition? Uh, yeah, there's an opposition on that one. Who signed in an opposition to Randall Street? Okay. Have you folks spoken? Yes. Okay. Um, do, would you like to speak to them? Sure. Okay. Just step outside and let us know when you're ready to go forward. 2017-148, um, 2000 Rock Rose Avenue, Leonard Clatterbuck. All right, and who signed in there? Uh, I did. All right, and have you folks spoken? We have either. Okay, um, any desire to continue talking or? We're unable to agree. Okay, have a seat. We'll call you in turn. Um, and then last 2017, that's 157, 1206 Springfield Avenue. That was withdrawn. Yes, I know it was withdrawn, but someone signed in in opposition oh, to it. Uh, she she went home. Okay, I, she did. I explained what happened. She got okay. her left her name. Okay. In case somehow it comes back. Okay, it shouldn't um, because it's been withdrawn. But okay, good. Thank you very much, Councilman. All right. Um, well, we'll call the first case first. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 2017 121 1607 Covington Street. Michael Corwick. Come on forward. I'm sorry? Um, Mr. Corwick is. Yes, sir. Uh, is Mr. Prettle involved in this? Uh, I believe he is, yes. Okay, you want to step back and grab him? Uh, well, you step back and grab him if. So, uh, our clients don't have any pressing needs. They'll try to do their best to be here on the 23rd. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Hmm? Okay. Sir? Can, sorry, I didn't get his name. Nate, can you grab him? No, the guy who just left on the other case. Covington. On Covington. Jason Weaver, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're going to... Sorry for all the confusion. Yeah, it's not Covington, right? Mm -mm. No, I'm Covington. Just hold tight. Okay. <laughs> We're multitasking. Sure, no problem. Anybody else out there? What? No, the uh, your opposition on the other case oh, about Randall the continuance Street. on rent. We have a three o'clock and a five o'clock on the twenty. Oh, on the twenty third. Okay, I'll let yeah. them know. Okay. Can you run out and slam it up real quick? Kevin Donovan, I live at 1609 Covington Street. Mm -hmm. They're going to consider it. Okay. With, as far as the three or the five? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. 
Uh, calling 2017-121-1607 Covington Street. Michael Korwek. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Mr. Korwek, we have this as an application to construct a two-story rear addition and rooftop deck at this location. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. If all those intend to give testimony, can raise their right hands and be sworn, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony? Raise your right hand, please. Your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. I do. All right. Do we have staff reports? Planning Department has no comment on this application. All right. Ms. Korbeck. Yes. Uh, why don't you tell us a bit about what uh, is being proposed here? Sure. So the, the plans that you have are, are actually going to be a bit outdated. Um, after facing some opposition from my neighbor, I believe we worked out an agreement. Um, that plan is currently going to be redrawn by my architecture firm, NW2. Um, essentially, what I'm looking to do is take the existing plan, um, continue with the addition, but instead of um, building it out to the complete width of the property. Uh, I'm going to shorten it by roughly 12 inches um, from my property line of the width only, so the lengthwise addition will still be proceeding. Okay. And the roof deck will be built as planned as well. You said you're going to be doing uh, revised plans on this? That's correct. We just reached an agreement on Sunday, so otherwise I would have had a, a revised plan for you all today. All right. And those plans will show the proposed, um, I guess, the rear addition pulling back, would you say, a foot? So the width is going to be pulled back a foot, not the length. Yes. The on both the first and second story. Okay, so the side is going to be correct. pulled back That's correct. from the side property line by about a foot correct so will that follow the foundation line for the basement Is that what you're talking no about? I believe it'll still be further out than that okay yes yeah, so there's gonna be a new footer okay. done on the first first floor yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's correct the uh, existing wall is 17 inches from the property line in the breezeway mr. Corwick's gonna move it so it's 12 inches from the uh, okay. property line all right uh, Mr. Predel, is there yeah, anything you want to say as to your uh, points in this? I'm glad we were able to come to an agreement. My client, Mr. Donovan, who's at 1609 Covington, had some concerns about his access to light and air as well as the way his mechanical equipment uh, functioned if it were to go to the property line. Mm -hmm. and we appreciate Mr. Korwek working with us, and you know, I think this is an ideal solution. Maybe not ideal for either of them, but ideal that there's no uh, opposition to it anymore. Well, glad you all could uh, work together on this. Anything further? I think that's it. I think that's good. I would just ask that um, the revised plans be submitted sure. prior to the resolution. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say the um, uh, as part of any approval in this case, uh, it would likely be conditioned on receipt of the updated plans. Understood. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Rubin. Yep. Okay. Mr. Rubin, can you come up for a second? Okay. Just and you too, Mr. Prettle. Just wanted to let you know, make you aware that on um, the Linwood uh, case, uh, when we come back on the 23rd, we have a three o'clock and a five o'clock docket that day. Um, so you can, uh, it, as opposed to our typical schedule where we convene at one. So as you're looking at uh, a rescheduling for next week, or like the next session, um, you'll just need to figure out which one you want to make. If uh, if people have problems with coming um, while they're at work or something like that, um, you can schedule for the five o'clock if that accommodates them. Or if folks can make the three o'clock, you can do that as well. But just want to make you aware that it will not be at the typical one o'clock time. Very All much right. appreciate it. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. <coughs> Sure. Um, <laughs> just to clean that one up, 2017. Yeah, I yeah, know. 2017-137-823 South Linwood, South Linwood Avenue is postponed. Um, all right. 2000. Well, I think he's still. Yeah, he's outside. Uh, Burton's outside. Two, two, three, 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 three. Jeez, we got nothing but opposition. Okay. Hmm? Ah, 
2017-148, 2000 Rock Rose Avenue, Leonard Clatterbuck. Good afternoon. Afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. All right. Your name for the record? I'm Walter Howard uh, at 2014 Rock Rose Avenue. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Platterbuck, we have this as an application to store a boat uh, slash boat trailer in a rear yard. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. If all those intending to give testimony can raise their right hands and be sworn, please. We swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. All right. Do we have staff report? Uh, we do. We received a letter from the Woodbury Community Association on uh, May 9, 2017, uh, requesting that the appeal be denied because the appellant has not met with the immediate neighbors uh, or the association for support of this appeal. Uh, moreover, the association took a poll of those who may be affected by the approval of this appeal, uh, and according to the letter, quote, uh, it indicated negative reaction for this variance. Unquote. All right. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is an end of row residential building uh, on a lot which is approximately 15 feet 6 inches wide. The zoning code requirements which the Planning Department requests may be made approval conditions include those contained in the zoning code section 14-306. At no time will this equipment be used for living or housekeeping purposes. The equipment will not have fixed connections to electricity, water, gas, or sanitary sewer facilities, except as specified in subsection B. If the equipment is parked or stored outside of a garage, it will be parked or stored to the rear of the front building line of the lot and located at least three feet from the side or rear lot lines. The equipment will be kept in good repair and carry a current year's license and registration. And the parking lot or storage is not of an unoccupied mobile home, being a movable or portable dwelling constructed to be towed on its own chassis and connected to utilities and design without a permanent foundation for year-round living, which is specifically prohibited. So the Section B referred to provides that equipment may be stored and parked anywhere on the premises for a period of not more than 48 hours for loading or unloading purposes. The, ap the applicant needs to be prepared to comply with these conditions, provided that the width of the boat permits compliance with the three-foot separation requirements cited above. On that basis, the department recommends approval subject to those conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Kleiderbach, are those conditions stated by the planning department acceptable to you? Yes, sir. All right. Why don't you tell us about what you're looking to do here? I'm just looking to store my boat in the backyard. Okay. On a nicely new poured cement pad. Okay, a um, couple of questions for you. Yes, sir. Um, what kind of boat is it? It is a um, inboard outboard, 17 foot, on a trailer. Okay, um, how wide is the trailer? I took some measurements. I have uh, visuals of it, um, if you need to see those. Sure, um, that'll be helpful, but sure. if there are no measurements included, that really There are measurements helpful. from the fence to the boat trailer itself. Okay. Why don't you share those with us, too? Sure. And now you said the boat is 17 feet Correct. long. Correct. How wide is the boat? Well, the yard is 15, so I'm saying it's going to be about seven feet wide. Okay. a picture of the boat sitting on the pad okay. there are other pictures there if you want to scroll around I have a bunch of pictures of the boat and different angles and some measurements on there also okay you said that there are measurements yes there? there's four feet on both sides of that boat trailer 
You can um, make that bigger, yes. I did the best I could. And have you shared these photographs with your opposition? I have not. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and do that? Okay. Um. <coughs> you can scroll through and take a look. I do have some. That's boots in midfield. That. I see. There's the you. four feet. All right. Um. Is there anything further you'd like to add at this point? Um, just that I try to do everything possible to please anyone just so I can keep this boat in the yard. If something else needs to be done, I don't have a problem going forward doing that. Okay. Sir. Thank you. I first want to say that Mr. Clatterbuck has been a good neighbor, and I've appreciated a peaceful existence with you. Thank you. Up to this point. And I wish that we could approve this, but it's a slippery slope. These are narrow lots close to each other, and there are other people who will want to store stuff if we begin to allow this. The existence of other current freestanding sheds and garages does not justify the addition of other stuff. The whole point, I think, of this exercise is to keep clear what we can keep clear on property. Mm -hmm. I thought that you would also have letters specifically from 2006 and 2008 Rock Rose who told me that they had sent in opposition. And I thought I heard that you were stipulating that the boat would be stored there for no more than 48 hours, which is not Mr. Clatterbuck's intent. No, not what he said. <laughs> Can you? The, um, the code is written so that if you don't get permission to permanently store your boat, you can bring it in. Say you're getting ready to go on vacation, you bring it in for 48 hours and pack it up. That's allowed no matter what. That's what that section of the code in, deals with. But if you want to permanently keep your boat there, then you have to follow all the other conditions. That I, I understand. Uh, Rock Rose Avenue is on Television Hill, and it being a hill, my property is above Mr. Clatterbuck's property at the bottom of a row of ten houses. <coughs> this is visible to us and the other adjacent neighbors, so I'm sorry that I must object. Okay. Um, uh, there is a um, code within the uh, or the provision within the zoning code which deals with um, storage of boat trailers. Um, and what that says is that um, that, it's, uh, that that is permissible with some conditions. Um, and those conditions basically are the same ones which the planning department had offered um, as conditions of their approval. Essentially what their position is that they're okay with it so long as he agrees to comply with the code. Um, <clears throat> And those conditions, again, are, it says, is that the board must find and require as condition of approval that at no time will this equipment be used for living or housekeeping purposes. Uh, two, the equipment will not have fixed connections to electricity, gas, uh, water, or sanitary sewer facilities. Basically, you're not using it as a residence. Uh, three, except only as specified in subsection B of this section, if the equipment is parked or stored outside of a garage, it will be parked uh, or stored to the rear of the front building line of the lot and located uh, at least three feet from the side or rear uh, lot lines. Um, and what that's basically saying is that it can be stored outside of a structure um, and so long as it is stored to the rear of the property and is uh, at least three feet from the rear or um, uh, the rear or uh, side property lines. Here, uh, it would appear from the photographs that the 
that the trailer is located four feet uh, from either the uh, uh, either side property line. As far as its distance from the rear lot line, um, that part isn't quite so clear, though I note the... It does um, have that space. It, the drawing on the pad is that it's 22 feet long, and the testimony is that the boat is 17 feet long, so that would mean that he would be five feet back from the rear building line. So there at least are, is sufficient information in the record at this point to conclude that he's able to comply with that. Um, and then uh, that there's, uh, it has to be kept in good repair, and he has to keep a current year's license. People can't basically be keeping wrecked boats and such on their property. Um, and five, that the parking or storage is not of an unoccupied mobile home, being a movable or portable dwelling constructed with toes on its own chassis, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, so that people can't set up mobile homes on, uh, on property and live there. Um, so at least as far as what the code requires for these kinds of uses, um, he's, um, we would certainly be requiring, and um, he's presented evidence that he would be able to comply with uh, each of those conditions. Um, uh, the, you know, I know that at, um, at various points, um, uh, people can become a little bit surprised as to the um, range of various different uses of property which are permissible under the code, um, uh, but those uses uh, where they are allowed under the code are nonetheless permissible so long as um, uh, they are complying with other portions of the code. Uh, was there anything further? No. Okay. And Mr. Kladerbuck, anything you would like to say uh, uh, to close? No. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much, Joan. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. We're with the opposition for Randall Street, and we're going to request a postponement for uh, 5 o'clock on May 23rd. Okay. She has some issues not so much related to the zoning aspects, although she may, but some related to a property between this property and hers and um, a dilapidated property that we feel like we can address within this next two weeks, and I hope to come to an agreement by then. Okay. Just uh, so we can... Uh, sort of tie a bow on this. 2017-146-143 West Randall Street. Uh, Mr. Prettle, you here on this case? Correct. All right, and ma'am, your name for the record? Terry Rich. Okay, and Ms. Rich, you signed in earlier? Okay, and uh, you're postponing this until the 23rd, Mr. Prettle, at 5? At 5 p.m., is that correct? Okay, all right. 2017-146-143 West Randall Street is postponed. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Just jump in with both feet. 2017-107, 301 West 29th Street, Caroline Hecker. Hecker, we have this as an application to add live entertainment and dancing to food court. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. If all those intending to give testimony can please raise their right hands and be sworn. Do you swear or affirm? Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Is there I anyone else coming up? You guys all set? Yes. All right. And ma'am, uh, I think uh, you were approaching, but I did. I think I saw your right hand raised. Uh, and you took the oath? Okay. All right. Um, Ms. Hecker, uh, we've got some, and Ms. Floyd, uh, we received the preliminary motion in this case. Um, and 
Ms. Floyd, um, having reviewed your motion, I understand basically your position is that um, because in your view um, uh, the uh, Remington Road uh, PUD permits uh, restaurants with live entertainment and dancing and, access and including accessory outdoor table service um, that there is no need for the current appeal um, and therefore the board does not have jurisdiction in the matter. Is that May I clarify that a little bit? Because after I filed that motion mm -hmm. two weeks ago, I did speak with the zoning administrator, uh, Mr. Veal, and I've attached to my reply, I've attached his email that he sent out afterwards. And he does a, he did agree with me that, that the live entertainment is a permitted use in the Remington Road pod. He had some concerns about aspects of the application which weren't um, evident from the application, such as the issue of outdoor live entertainment and the issue of hours. So he addressed, um, he mentioned those concerns in the um, in the email, and so in my reply, I, I actually suggested that perhaps what we need to be doing here is remanding to the zoning administrator for him to look at these issues in the first instance, and and then if those if those decisions are not you know acceptable to either party, then they could come to this board on appeal from the zoning administrator. But it does appear that he does agree that that the um, that the live entertainment is a permitted use in in the PUD. And, and so that was my, you know, my first thing I wanted to explain today was my request for remand, which is a, a slight, you know, change, I think, because obviously you have jurisdiction to do something about something that comes before you, but you don't have jurisdiction to deal with this as a conditional use. You, I think you do have jurisdiction to remand it to the zoning administrator. Well, um, we'll get to that point in a minute. Um, Ms. Hecker, your response. Um, I have seen the um, reply memorandum that Ms. Floyd filed with the request for a remand and the correspondence that she attached um, from Mr. Veal, which was an email from Mr. Veal to me um, that was produced after a meeting that he had with Ms. Floyd. I subsequently responded to his email. Um, his email only had one side of the, the argument from Ms. Floyd. I had not yet been had, had an opportunity to respond to that. Um, at, you know, as a practical matter, the zoning administrator procedurally has denied our application and we are on appeal to the zoning board from the denial of the um, application for live entertainment because that's how things come to the zoning board. So I think, it, I, I see this sort of as a delay tactic because, because I think at the Absolutely. end of the day, this is something that's going to be, uh, end up back in front of the board in the first instance once, once he has denied in some fashion the application for live entertainment, which he's already done. Um, May I just respond just briefly? Sure. It is not a delay tactic. This is this is real serious stuff. And he well, the, the he, motive, he did not frankly, frankly he the, did not the motive really isn't determinative whether it's delay or not. The question really is what is the uh, you know the question is is the matter in front of us or not? Um, and can it be in front of us or not? whether the reason why people make various different arguments is their own business. That's not really what we're here to determine. Um, uh, and what struck me about your motion was that it didn't really so much make an argument that the board didn't have jurisdiction in the matter. Um, uh, it really went to the question of whether or not the board could properly approve the, uh, uh, what's being requested. Um, which I think is a different question which reaches the merits. So I don't really see a reason why we should not hear the merits of the case, um, whether or not the relief which is being requested is permissible under either the PUD or the zoning code is a question which we will reach as part of the hearing of the, the, hearing of the substance of the case. Um, uh, I think that council is correct that the uh, that at this point they've had an application which has been denied by Mr. Veal um, and they're appealing his denial. Um, uh, if you want to bring out that certain aspects of their case weren't presented to Mr. Veal and which are still I'm going to imagine in your view impermissible under the code you can certainly do that as part of your op as part of your opposition to their case but that really reaches the merits of the case as opposed to the threshold question <coughs> as to whether or not the um, uh, whether or not the uh, the case is properly in front of us 
Um, I would have to request, I, I noticed that Ms. Hecker did not, was not sworn in, but she is the applicant. She has attested to certain matters already, and I would ask that she be sworn in so that she can um, be examined because she has attested to certain matters already on the application. She is the applicant. Um, she is the attorney for the applicant, um, and in as much as um, uh, attorneys present arguments on behalf of a client, the board certainly does understand that uh, any representation which she makes um, are uh, on behalf of her client and not necessarily her own representations. Furthermore, um, um, Ms. Hecker is ethically bound as to her representation to this tribunal, even though it's not a court. She still has an ethical obligation, as does Mr. Williams, um, to truthfulness. Uh, so I, uh, I, I don't think that it is necessary for her to be sworn, nor do I think that it would be um, proper for her to be subject to examination. Um, you certainly can challenge um, uh, her statements, um, and you can present evidence and arguments in opposition to those statements, um, but as counsel for the parties, she's not a witness in the case. Well, I would just, um, when we get to that point, I guess I'll have to do something about that. <laughs> Because, oh. I, you know, I, I don't understand why I'm not able to question the applicant. That would be my concern. Okay. Um, do we have staff reports? <clears throat> we do. We received an email on uh, April 21st, 2017 from a resident living on the 2800 block of Huntington Avenue who su uh, supports this appeal due to a previously positive experience with the ownership of the property. During, the, during this experience, there was an issue with the garbage collection on the premise, uh, and the owner responded within a couple hours of the inquiry, um, and the neighbors complained, um, and the issue was immediately fixed. Um, in addition to that, we received another email uh, on April 24, 2017, uh, from a homeowner within the Remington community in support of this appeal. Uh, and then we also received a letter from uh, Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark um, on April 24th uh, stating that she went door to door with the immediate neighbors and discovered no objections. Um, however, the Councilwoman did have a list of condi conditions relative to this appeal. Um, uh, the first one being uh, noise and she requests that um, a maximum decimal limit of uh, 58 uh, be set and that be reduced to uh, by five decimals uh, from the hours of 9 p.m. to 7 a.m., uh, which is required for any use uh, that borders a residential zone. Uh, no permanent speaker is uh, or will be located on the outside of the R House building, and any temporary speakers provided by the live entertainer, uh, live entertainers located outside will be pointed towards the soundproof restaurant building. Uh, as far as the hours um, relative to live entertainment, she requests that uh, no live entertainment uh, go past 10 p.m. on Sundays, uh, that the hours of operation for live entertainment Monday through Thursday be from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., uh, and on Friday, uh, startup for the live entertainment can begin on 6 p.m. Um, Saturday would be the only day that n is not explicitly stated, and she left that to the uh, proposed hours uh, requested by the applicant. Um, and in her final request, she's the deals with the nature of the live entertainment, uh, be limited to uh, musical acts, which includes karaoke, theatrical acts, which includes stand-up comedy, uh, dance, and disc jockeying. Uh, the last letter that we received is from the Greater Remington Improvement Association on April 25th, 2017. In support of this appeal, uh, in their letter of support, the association sees the proposed use as adding a positive resource and enhancement of the neighborhood enjoyment and believes the proposed use will not cause any negative effects. Thank you. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted this property is contained in the Remington Row Planned Unit Development. Its ordinance designates this property as part of its Area B, in which restaurants may extend table service to no later than midnight, and the license establishment portion, now known as R Bar, is limited to 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. hours of operation. All live entertainment and dancing, accessory to the multiple restaurants, must therefore end by midnight. The department is also noting the concerns previously mentioned that because the building is designed with roll-up window doors along Remington Avenue, that there be uh, protections given to the residences across the street, and also that therefore the speakers for live entertainment be directed away from those residences and those windows along Remington Avenue. The application states that security would be on call 
The department is concerned that given the combination of open sides of our house during mild weather, the fire rated capacity of the premises, which is 650 persons, and the presence of our bar within the establishment, it would be advisable for there to be at least three security guards present during live entertainment and dancing events. And the department would obviously encourage more than three under certain conditions. The department recommends that approval of this application be subject to these conditions in addition to conditions which the board may establish. There will be on-site security provided during live entertainment events. A copy of the use and occupancy permit for the premises must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. A copy of the written approval by this board of the live entertainment provided on the premises, including details of any restrictions or limitations on live entertainment provided, must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. And a copy of all other permits and licenses required pursuant to the written approval of the board must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hecker, are those conditions stated by the planning department acceptable to your client? The three that relate to keeping copies of the permits and approvals on the site, we don't have any objection to. The one about maintaining security guards on the premises during uh, live entertainment events, we think is probably very appropriate at a concert hall, but the type of live entertainment that we're proposing here, we don't think is going to generate the types of crowds or um, the level of um, disturbance that would necessitate um, you know, certainly three security guards. The live entertainment that we're proposing might be a small, and we'll you know, discuss this in more detail, but a small band, um, a trivia night, that kind of thing. Um, you know, we think that, you know, as I said, in, in a, a larger concert venue, certainly having um, security on site makes a lot of sense. We do have a contract with a security company who patrols the area um, continuously while they're open. Um, they have cameras, they have managers. That's outdoor on-site. security, correct? Yes, um, yes. Uh, and so their duty is to patrol like the surrounding area and neighborhood as opposed to the monitor s- the maybe directly they're outside. The they're not monitoring inside. our house specifically. They're monitoring the entire Remington Row PUD, which is both blocks, the 27 and 2800 block there. Um, they, they can be called to go on site. Yeah, they, I mean, they can certainly be called in and um, they can go on site and walk around. Uh, but we don't think you know, for having... Certainly for having like a trivia night, for example, I don't know that it's necessary for us to have bouncers at the door for that. So um, the security people that you're talking about do would come into the building in the event of Oh, absolutely, a yes. But what about a disc jockey and dancing? Is that part of the plan as well? It is. Um, not every night, obviously, but from time to time they would have, uh, they'd like to have the flexibility to have a, a DJ in dancing. In a small dance area, it's shown on the floor plan that we'll, we'll hand out. Um, but it's, they're not planning to clear out all the tables and have a discotheque there. It, it'll be a small dance area limited um, in size to a small portion of the premises. And what other conditions offered by the planning department are you not agreeing to? That's the only one. The other ones we're fine with. Okay. As I understood, well, I'll ask Mr. French. Um, so as I understood it, the planning department was offering um, conditions under which they would be willing to agree to what you're seeking. I guess it's up to them if there is less than full agreement if they would still be in support. <clears throat> the if planning you- department's concerns relate uh, obviously to first the operation of the property itself as has been discussed and the potential for problems not necessarily again with the current operator because this approval if granted becomes something that can be passed with the property to other operators. Secondly, the issue about ensuring that the speakers that are used for any live entertainment amplification are turned away from the open windows, specifically those along Remington Avenue, so that there is not sound blasting through the windows towards the residences across the street is also a concern of the department. And that's a matter of floor plan as much as anything else, the relationship of the staging area for the live entertainment to the dance floor, for example. And the floor plan that was available to the planning department did show an area that would be designated as a dance floor, but it did not show where the live entertainment would actually be staged. And for that reason, the department was concerned. By the way, I'll just note, well, unless we have something in the file, Mr. Tanner, I'm not seeing a floor plan here. But, um, So um, we're at an impasse. Um, You have 
the planning department has stated what they want. You have stated what you're willing to do and what you would rather not do. The planning department has reiterated, in response to that, the planning department has reiterated its concerns. I'm not hearing a change in their position. Um, you may say you don't want their approval and reject their conditions, in which case you go forward without their participation in the case. You may postpone the case so that you can see if you can get a resolution. I think we'd like to proceed. Um, you know, I think the board has the authority to attach certainly any number of conditions that it would like. If the board determines that the planning department's conditions are appropriate, then we will certainly respect the conditions. Um, you know, we'll go into, as we you know, present the case, we'll go into more detail about what specifically is proposed in terms of live entertainment so that the board can better understand what is actually before um, you for approval today. Okay. Um, I would say at the outset that the board, at least I will imagine that the board would have similar concerns to the planning department. Um, uh, so we would uh, have looked to there to be some elaboration on those points. But Just to be clear, the only thing that we are um, not in full agreement with the planning department is having security guards in the premises. The issue about where the speakers are going to be located and all that is not a concern of ours. Okay. Um, I'd say on that point, at least speaking for myself, um, I mean, you'll have to go through a little bit more of the layout and what's being proposed. Um, and certainly, as I understand the position of your opposition, um, they're really concerned about the effect of um, this use upon the surrounding neighborhood, and particularly whether or not this is a use uh, confined to being indoors or not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just in sort of noting the um, trends in design for various different establishments. There's been kind of an embracing of the idea of um, having demisable um, uh, walls and such um, to give a more airy and open feeling to places, um, which certainly I can understand that. But when it comes to adding things um, such as um, live entertainment DJs, um, even something as innocuous sounding as Trivia Night, which has someone presumably on a microphone asking questions. There's a lot of sort of back and forth. A lot of the rowdiness which goes on within, a, um, uh, within an establishment then is no longer confined inside of it. It instead is shared with everyone around it who may or may not want to participate in that. So um, I hear the planning department's concern on that, and I think that you should take that to heart and, again, include that in your presentation. Absolutely. So, proceed. All right, uh, let me introduce first who's up here with me. I'm joined by my colleague, Justin mm -hmm. Williams from Rosenberg Martin, as well as Peter DePrinzio, who's the general manager of our house. Jed Weeks is with the Greater Remington Improvement Association, and Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark is down there <laughs> with, her, with her letter. <laughs> Um, this is an application, as you know, for live entertainment in the Our House restaurant. Our House is part of the Remington Row Plant Unit Development, which was, oh yeah, let me hand this out, um, enacted by City Council Ordinance in 2014. Mr. Williams is handing out a folder with several exhibits that we'll walk through, and the first thing that you'll see in the file there is a copy, uh, pardon me, of the, of the PUD itself. Um, the project is a $60 million mixed-use project. It includes residential, re retail, and office components. Um, Seawall has been developing it over the last several years. They have um, really focused on this idea of collaborative workspaces, um, and they've been very successful at Miller's Court and Union Mill in, in terms of providing that type of, of space for teachers and incubator space for local nonprofits. And our house is really the next step of that in terms of creating incubator space for restaurants. And if you haven't been in there, there are about um, you know 10 or so stalls, small um, restaurant vendors that all uh, operate together with a shared seating area. It allows restaurateurs to really get a, a start on um, you know the restaurant business if they're not able to lease a full uh, restaurant space themselves. Uh, in the file, you'll see a rendering of the uh, 2700 block building, which was the new construction, the um, apartment building. It has 108 units in it. And then you'll also see in 2015, the board may recall that we um, were here, in fact, on an appeal from the Planning Commission's approval of a minor amendment for Block B of the PUD, which is where our house is located. Um, a copy of the Planning Commission approval from that minor amendment is included in the file, as well as a rendering of Area B of the PUD, um, which, as I said, they're probably familiar with. Um, 
one of the things that was at issue in the minor amendment was how many parking spaces were going to be provided within the PUD. Um, and the minor amendment at that time pro uh, provided for 43 spaces to be provided on site and the remaining 18 spaces that would be required for our house were located within area A of the PUD. So there's a total of 161 parking spaces required. 303 total parking spaces are provided within the PUD. Um, and in addition, the developer has recently entered into an agreement with the Baltimore Police Department to lease the police lot at 242 West 29th Street. There are 98 additional spaces there, and they have also acquired two additional parking lots located at 300 and 329 West 29th Street to provide additional parking options. In total, they have over 400 parking spaces to serve the R House use as well as the other uses in the PUD. Um, and you know, so the, that covers the, the parking issue. The restaurant, as I said, is a shared restaurant concept, um, shares an open seating area. There are about 10 kitchens, each one with a unique culinary idea. There are about 270 seats in the, the restaurant, as well as a, a centrally located bar that has about 40 bar stools. Um, the outdoor seating area has capacity for up to 100 seats. And there is a floor plan in the file. Um, that I'll draw your attention to that shows uh, the layout of the site. The um, Specifically, since you asked about it a moment ago, the proposed dance floor is outlined in red. It's an area that's 18 by 23 feet. It would require the removal of two tables with eight seats apiece. It's very small in size, um, and that is where the dance floor would, would be located um, in the event that they have dancing. And I'll, I'll come to a little bit more detail about what type of live entertainment is proposed in, in a moment. I've also included in the file some of the press articles that um, have been out recently about uh, the R House concept. It's been very well received. Um, there are some articles from Baltimore Magazine. Um, there's one from Bethesda Magazine. There's one from USA Today. There's one from the Baltimore Sun. All you know, very positive reviews of this type of establishment, which is sort of becoming more and more popular, the idea of this kind of marketplace concept. Um, and I, there are also some photographs in the file. You can see exactly you know, what it looks like inside. It's an open seating area. Um, and it's, it has been very successful. If you've been by there in the evenings, it's, it's very lively. Um, they've created about 150 part and full-time jobs, um, as well as another about 50 jobs or so in the upstairs office space. Um, and you know, one of the, the important jobs that they've created is that of a traffic director who is responsible for um, directing folks who are coming specifically to our house in the evening to where there is parking available because we want to make sure that we're not um, creating problems for people who live in the neighborhood in terms of finding a parking space. So you know, they've been in operation for a little while now, and we now would like to add live entertainment to what they're, um, what they're doing there. And what we're proposing to do is to offer live entertainment at various locations on the R House premises. It is proposed to be both indoors and outdoors, probably not at the same time. Um, but there would be, in the, the specific location might change. If we were doing a trivia night, they might set up in one space inside. If, if there was going to be a DJ, it would probably be close to the dance floor area. If they were going to have, they might have a small band outside. Um, they have a, a huge patio. As I said, it's um, has seating for about 100 people. So it's this is not the situation where you have a small uh, strip of outdoor tables on the sidewalk in front of a restaurant. This is a very large outdoor patio, both along Remington Avenue and then between uh, the 2800 block and the 2700 block fully on their property. Um, and they would like the ability to have live entertainment out there from time to time. It could be acoustic music, it could be a DJ, um, it could be small theatrical acts. We've had some interest from residents of the neighborhood in putting on small performances. Uh, uh, the position of your opposition that outdoor live entertainment isn't permissible. Right. Um, or anywhere. there anywhere else. Right. The, the zoning code is silent on that. The zoning code doesn't specifically authorize live entertainment um, and call it out for indoors or outdoors. It describes it as being an accessory used to a restaurant. There's a general provision in the zoning code that says um, business uh, processing service uses must do be within an enclosed structure. And in my view, the live entertainment use is an accessory is to the restaurant use. It's not its own use. It's not a separate business. It's not a separate processing or storage use. The business use is the restaurant. And so I think wherever the restaurant is, the live entertainment can be. And it's obviously going to be subject to the same hours of operation as the, as the restaurant. We're not going to have live entertainment till 2 o'clock in the morning after the restaurant closes. It's going to be, you know, within... within Why couldn't you? Well... 
we couldn't because I think because the the PUD would restrict us to closing the restaurant at midnight, and I think that goes with the accessory but uses. Into your concept, you could close the restaurant, keep the restaurant, keep the live entertainment use, which is accessory to the restaurant use. Does not required to have the same hours, so you could have the restaurant be closed and keep the live entertainment going. We would be willing to stipulate that we will not do that, and we would certainly accept that as a condition to the the approval. We don't plan to be open after midnight. Um, on Fridays and Saturdays and 10 o'clock earlier than that. We're also proposing to close the hour, the um, outdoor entertainment to, to stop that at 10 o'clock every night so that there isn't a band outside after um, you know, 10 o'clock is a, a try to make sure that we don't disturb the neighbors you know, to the extent possible. The neighbors are very supportive of this. And in fact, in the file, you'll see there's a petition that's signed by two thirds of the residents who live on the property or the, on the properties directly across Remington Avenue. Um, and there are a few signatures from the folks who live behind us on the other side. They're all very supportive of the, the proposed uh, outdoor live entertainment and indoor live entertainment. And Mr. Weeks is here, we'll hear from him in a moment. Um, you know, he, from the, the Greater Remington Improvement Association, and they don't have an objection to having live entertainment outside. And we are still subject to the noise regulations that are in the city code, which Councilwoman Clark has pointed out in her letter that there are um, specific limits on the number of decibels that the any type of live entertainment, be it indoors or outdoors, could have. And we fully intend to comply with those limits, whether the rest the live entertainment is occurring inside or outside. Um, I know, you know, Mr. Weeks can probably talk about this, but I, I understand that several residents of the neighborhood have been walking around measuring decibels from time to time, and you know, it's it's very interesting to see how loud things are. You know, I don't really have a good sense of what a decibel sounds like, but there are limits in. Well, decibels. on that point, mm -hmm. um, I went to walk my dog the other day, <laughs> I guess last night, <clears throat> and when I was inside, I kept on hearing this music that was playing outside, and. I had thought that there was some concert that was going on uh, at Pier 6, uh, but when I went outside, it sounded like, no, the music wasn't coming from Pier 6. It was coming from down to the east of me. And it was only once I got to the intersection, which was uh, then open so there weren't any buildings obstructing it, it became clear what was going on. It was actually Metallica practicing oh, doing at the their yes at the stadium, and the sound, sound was checks. projecting <laughs> two miles away, and it was ricocheting off of a large apartment building by me and deflecting the sound back. So that's how sound can travel in an urban environment. Respectfully, we're not planning to have Metallica at our house. That's just by way of example. <laughs> I, I, I understand your concern. Um, the sound limits, I think, that are in place at M&T Stadium are quite a bit higher than sound limits that are in areas that border on residential zones. But everything um, is relative. Everything is relative. Everything and, and is relative. And music that may have a significantly lower decibel level may be just as... Uh, audible to someone 500 feet away. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, certainly our goal is not to be disruptive to the community, which is why we've done extensive community outreach to make sure that our neighbors are comfortable both with, you know, the application and specifically what's proposed. The letter that um, was read into the file describes how responsive the developer has been to concerns about um, noise. You know, there was a neighbor who, who sent a letter to the zoning board um, to describe his positive experience with us based on, you know, the noise that was being made during trash collection times. Um, and, the, you know, the developer was out there that morning to understand the issue, and then by the time the trash collection came again later that week, it was resolved. So to the extent that there are complaints, this is not a developer or property owner who is, you know, known to be a bad actor or unresponsive to the community. You know, we're certainly, we, we Seawall is very, very heavily invested in Remington, and it's not in their interests to um, be disruptive or um, create a, a situation where the community doesn't like them. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm sorry. i don't not attorney. I don't know how this works, but I would like to object to the petition and not make sure that's not part of the evidence of record. And I've explained, I'm, my, my name is Joan Floyd. I'm 2828 North Howard Street, and I'm someone who is close enough to hear the, any outdoor entertainment. Um, this petition does not say anything about hours or outdoor live entertainment in particular. 
and I do not, I don't think, well, first of all, I know that petitions aren't generally allowed, it can be disallowed in these kinds of proceedings at any rate, but in this particular case, I don't, I personally was not, did not understand this included outdoor live entertainment until well, much later, so I don't think, I don't have, I think we understand that the people who signed any kind of petition realized that this includes outdoor live entertainment. I certainly didn't, and, um, um, and not, not, neither did the zoning administrator, so I really don't think this is proper. Okay. So um, we're not a um, political body, uh, so the abundance or lack of community support really isn't something which we um, have to look for. It helps to show that an applicant has reached out to community members and that the community may be largely supportive. Um, uh, but it's not really determinative in our hearings. Um, the, uh, typically, the, what, the way that we handle petitions are we take them for what they're worth. Um, it says, you know, the, uh, uh, the petition on the face of it says what it says. Um, whether or not these are actual people, whether or not these are their actual signatures, whether or not these are their actual addresses, um, uh, is something which we can't know and therefore makes petitions really of little weight. Um, we do receive them, but they're not really all that significant. Um, <clears throat> so we'll overrule the objection and we'll receive the petition as we typically do in these cases, but it is with the understanding that it is, uh, you know, that the board, um, what weight the, the board places on it is completely a separate matter. Please Thank continue, you. Ms. Thank you. Um, with regard to the standards that the board is required to consider in approving a conditional use, you know, the nature of the proposed site and the size, size, shape, and proposed size, shape, and arrangement of structures, um, as I said, the live entertainment is, is really intended to complement the restaurant use. We're not intending to be disruptive to the neighborhood, obviously, but we're intending to have music um, at a level that people can have a conversation over. You know, we're in the restaurant business. We're not a concert hall. We plan to have, um, you know, to the extent that we're going to have bands or um, a DJ or something like that, it's intended to be at a level that people can enjoy their meal with. Um, it's not supposed to be, it, we're not planning to have a venue where people are, you know, buying tickets to come and listen to music, um, you know, and, and have like accessory meals on the side of it. It's the reverse, that we're having a restaurant with accessory live entertainment. Um, as I said, it is proposed to be both indoors and outdoors. They have a very large patio outdoors. Um, it is within the board's authority, I believe, to determine the specific location or to attach conditions to the approval to determine the specific locations where live entertainment can be located. And, um, you know, we, one of the conditions that Councilwoman Clark had requested in her letter was that any outdoor speakers be focused, you know, towards the building as opposed to outwards towards the neighbors. We are 100% comfortable with that and in agreement with it. You know, we, like I said, we're not trying to disturb the neighbors at all. Um, you know, we want the sound to be um, contained on our, our property um, as much as possible and certainly not to be disruptive to the folks who live across the street. Um, there is a dance floor shown on the, the floor plan. It's a relatively small area compared to the size of the whole facility. Um, we would only be removing two eight-top tables uh, to, to create a dance floor in that area. We're not planning to clear the whole place out and have a, like I said, a discotheque. Um, with let regard to... Let me ask you a quick question, just yes, so I understand. I, I put an arrow on, on this. Is that where the, the bands or the live entertainment would be proposed to... That's the building. But um, I mean, no, it, my little arrow. Oh, um, actually, they, I believe it's here on the... Uh, it's to the extent that there are outdoor bands, they're probably going to be on the inside, actually. Yeah, so, th but I think he's pointing... Yes, that they're pointing to the area where the dance floor would be on the inside of the building. Right. No, but I'm talking where the outside music um, would be. Yeah, okay, so it's actually going to be... on that side of oh, the building. Oh, okay, okay, um, over there. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, just for your reference, on the floor plan on the um, page left over here, uh, there's a seating area, and we'd probably put it in the back of back here. Um, okay. 
Uh, with regard to the resulting traffic patterns and off-street parking, as I said, we're not intending to have a concert venue. We're not expecting that live entertainment is going to draw additional crowds beyond the people who are coming to eat there anyway. We have um, about 400 parking spaces located between uh, the PUD and the other lots that our client controls around the area. We have a um, traffic director who directs people to park in the appropriate places. Uh, no additional off-street parking is required to add live entertainment under the zoning code. Um, and as I said, we do provide more than adequate parking under the PUD. Uh, the nature of the surrounding area and the extent to which the proposed use might impair its present and future development. As I said, the, the applicant here is heavily invested in Remington and it is in their interest that the live entertainment here not impose um, any um, it repair any um, future development of the area. We want it to be an asset to the neighborhood. We want it to be a reason why people move to Remington um, and we want to make sure that we're good neighbors to everyone. We don't um, expect that it's going to create any type of an impediment to future development. And with regard to the proximity of dwellings, churches, and schools, and other places of public gathering, um, you know, it, we, we fully recognize that we are very close to residents. Um, there are homes directly across Remington Avenue, and, and there are um, noise regulations under both the zoning code and the health code that we fully intend to comply with. Um, you know, we understand that, that, as you said, noise ricochets off of buildings and, you know, in an urban environment. Um, you have to be particularly sensitive to the proximity to, to neighbors, and um, you know we fully intend to be. And as I said, we're planning to turn off any live entertainment um, outside by 10 o'clock, just to make sure that we're not um, you know, disturbing folks after it's, it's time to go to bed. The proposed live entertainment is not expected to have any impact on the, the accessibility for fire and police protection, or light and air, or adequate utilities, cultural or historic landmarks. Um, it's consistent with the city's master plan by adding an additional entertainment option for city residents. There's no urban renewal area here. Um, it is consistent with the, the purpose of the zoning code of encouraging the most appropriate use of land in the city. Um, and with regard to the general welfare, we do have letters of support from the Greater Remington Improvement Association. We do have the petition to, for whatever worth of weight it has. Um, there's a letter of support in the file as well from the council president as well as um, from the neighbor who uh, reached out on his own based on his good experiences with the, um, the property owner here. So you know, we do believe that there is, um, that it's squarely within the board's authority to approve live entertainment both indoors and outdoors within the our house premises, you know, the board does have the authority to attach conditions to an application for a conditional use that specify the precise location where the use can occur and that do specify the hours of operation. Um, and in and, and that end, I, I don't think I, I may have glossed over this, but the, hour, the proposed hours of operation are from 5 p.m. to midnight, except on um, Saturdays and Sundays they would like to open at 10 o'clock and on Sundays they would close at um, 10 o'clock p.m. Um, and with regard to outdoor live entertainment, they would close the outdoor live entertainment by 10 o'clock on any night. Um, Can you say those hours again? Uh, five, 5 p.m. to midnight. Um, that would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay. Saturday, they would open at 10 and stay open until midnight. And on Sunday, they would open at 10 and stay open until 10. Sunday, 10 to 10? Yeah, and that would allow them to have like a brunch, you know, probably like a jazz brunch or something. Again, not intending to be disruptive to the neighborhood, not certainly not starting early enough to wake folks up. And those hours on Monday through Friday, you said it's 5 to 12? Yes. Is that 5 a.m. or 5 p.m.? 5 p.m. Okay. So Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. to 12 a.m., Saturday, 10 a.m. A.m. to 12 a.m. And then um, uh, on those, uh, back up on those Monday through Friday hours, that's 5 p.m. through 12 a.m. Mm -hmm. And then on Sunday, that's 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yes, that's correct. And it, as I said, it is within the board's authority to impose limits on hours of operation for conditional uses and specifically for live entertainment. And so, um, you know, it's, as I, as I think I said at the very beginning, the PUD authorizes the restaurants to be open until midnight. We see this as an accessory use to the restaurant, and so it's within the restaurant hours of operation. Well, on that point, I was just looking at the, um, <coughs> at the code, and particularly 6305, um, which is the provision you were talking about as far as that uses have to be contained in the structure, and uh -huh. it says, 
Um, uses uh, 6305C uses to be enclosed exceptions. Um, one, except as specified in paragraph two of the subsection, business, servicing, processing, and storage uses must be located within accessory structures, period. Okay. Within accessory structures? I mean within enclosed structures, I'm sorry. Uh, two says this subsection does not apply to um, one, off-street parking and loading. Mm -hmm. Two, outdoor table service that is accessory to a restaurant use and has been approved by the board. And three, to the extent expressly authorized by an applicable urban renewal plan, the display of merchandise for sale to the public. So <clears throat> there, the code recognizes that outdoor table service is an accessory use to a restaurant and specifically mentions that it is an exception to this rule. So the code clearly intends, clearly envisions that here's an accessory use. It's not a business servicing, processing, or storage use. Um, it's accessory use and it is noting that as an, it is an exception to the rule about has to be within an enclosed structure. So doesn't that really get to the point that you were making as far as, well, the live entertainment's an accessory use, so that doesn't have to be enclosed? So why isn't it called out in the exceptions? Right. And I mean, it's, it's a fair point. What I would say is that it has been approved in other cases. We were very recently here on the Pendry Hotels application uh, for live entertainment. That included um, outdoor live entertainment on their, their large outdoor pool deck. Um, and you know, so I can at least point you to some precedent where the board has approved it in other cases. And again, I think the board has the authority to determine the location of the live entertainment under, um, I think it's subtitle 14 about conditional uses and specifically for live entertainment. But the location of the live entertainment um, is one of the things the board can attach a condition about. You can remind me or not. Um, I, I don't recall that there was opposition in that other case and That's I don't correct. believe. Oh, uh, no, you're right, there was not. And I don't yeah. believe that if there were any opposition, that that's what the focus of the opposition was. Yes, that's Anything true. further? Uh, no, I think we'll, we'll pause and respond to the opposition. Okay, Thank and you. Councilman? Thank you. Oh, yes. Councilperson, yes, please. <coughs> Good afternoon. I'm Mary Pat Clark. Um, City Council, 14th District, um, and I, um, I submitted this letter the last time around, and we were, and then we were postponed. Um, but it's still the same letter. Basically, I met um, with um, the owner of the our house and his honorable attorney and and manager Peter here. Um, uh, at the end of uh, at the end of well, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and with a long list. And um, it, we went back and forth and back and forth about it. And um, I went back and put together amendments that did not encompass everything, but encompassed what I thought was really crucial uh, for something that's across the street and, and backing right up to people's houses. Um, and I believe I'm correct that um, everyone involved on the R House side accepted m these amendments except for one, but I would still like the board to consider that, and that is um, the six o'clock start out, start up time uh, for the live entertainment, if we find that such a thing exists, which I, is, on, is for you to do. So I, if you don't mind, I would like to recite, I, I'm not gonna read my whole thing, but I would like to recite what I have submitted to this board as amendments, conditions. Um, from, as, about noise levels, three things. A maximum of 58 decibels at all times with this live entertainment and in this facility. And then, because at night, um, commercial, um, noise levels have to reduce by five points um, that uh, between the hours of 9 o'clock and 7 a.m. 
uh, in this particular location, that would mean 53 decibels, um, be just because nighttime sound reductions, the law says a reduction by five. And finally, um, in this section, no permanent speaker is or will be located on the outside of the R House building. And any temporary speakers provided by live entertainers, like they come with them, they show up with them, in the outside seating portion of the restaurant will be pointed, literally directed, into the soundproofed restaurant building. Now, about hours. Um, I started out with a much more um, ambitious um, amendment, but I've come down to this. Um, my recommendations would be that um, the hour, that uh, on Sunday the hours would close at 10 p.m. Next day is a work day. Um, 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock on Monday through Thursday, all leading into work days. 6 p.m. start up on Friday, and whatever they have down in their list, well, that's Friday. Um, I don't know what they have for Friday, but whatever they have down for closing on Friday. They've got 5 p.m. to 12 Monday through Friday. And I, I, I oppose that. Yeah, and you've got 6 p.m. to 10 Monday through Thursday. Right, work nights. Um, and then 6 p.m. until whenever they're playing. Whenever. That would be 12. On the week on for the Friday Friday. and Saturday. Mm -hmm. But, and I, and I would like to say about 6 p.m. instead of opening at 5. I, it's, just, it's just from my own experience. Um, no one who lives across the street or south um, or anywhere in the near vicinity of this um, application has reached out to me in protest. Um, our, I went to the RNA meeting, it was very informative, and I know that there are issues being raised here, um, but I have not heard actual opposition, but issues. Um, I know that GRIA will testify and they've approved it, um, but I'm concerned about the people across the street and behind, even though they think it's great now, and even though the owner is great now, and the manager now. All this goes with the property, not with good people who are standing here now. And at the least, uh, and finally, the fifth thing on my list, I, I would like the live entertainment restricted to the categories that were checked off on the application because they had other choices that they didn't make. And I'd like to keep it to the limits of what they said they would do and no more. Um, because they had an opportunity and they chose not to take it and so I'd like to take the opportunity for the future. Other people may come. Now, it seems impossible now but someday somebody may very well buy that eight, our house, um, and maybe the, the, the manager, who's an excellent one, will rise up to, maybe he'll buy it. Well, that would be handy, because he knows all these rules. But basically, in case it's not him, um, new people come in, and they don't know, they don't know all this background. And at least if it's in, the conditional use, it's in a, if it's in some document altogether, they'll know. Otherwise, it'll be, well, I remember once we went downtown, I forget where, and some people were sitting there and they said things. You know what I mean? Just like they do at city council. So it'll be written down and people will know. Um, and I would be very grateful if you would consider these um, these condition uses, otherwise I would not be in support, I mean, of this proposal. Thank you. Ms. Eck, I have, a, I guess, a technical question for you, and it, and it arises from the Councilwoman's 58, 53 decibel levels. From where would you measure that? Excellent question. That was actually something I wanted to clarify in response. Under the zoning code, they're measured at the zoning district boundary line, and she's proposing straight from the, the code sections in her letter. And, and under those sections of the code, which I think I may have copies of. Well, if you look at the application for live entertainment, it talks about uh, 
and measured at 10 feet from any point on your structure. So would you... But it gives a very large range in the application. I think it's like 40 to 80. It does. Yeah. It does. Um, well, the, but I'm, I understand that we're between 58 and 53. That's, that's the, the appellant's position. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I'm sorry, say that again. Are you, are, have you accepted the 58 to 53? Yeah, and that's, that's codified, and I think that provision is in the health code. Well, but it's not in the health code as applied to the R house. It's just a general, because when I asked, then what the uh, honorable counsel sent back to me was the entire noise title of the zoning code. Right. Been, at which been, point yeah. I got on the phone to the health department experts <laughs> and we came up with this appropriate level within that title. And, and it seemed like a reasonable one. What police officers used to say, I don't know if they still do in this high tech age, was, um, being too loud is if they can hear it 50 feet away. And that's how we have done bars for a long time. I, what I would say is that none of us here are experts in sound dynamics or decibel limits. No, I don't and disagree so with that, but I'm, I'm saying I think there needs to be a specific point where you say we're going, this is where we will take the, the measurement. Oh, from. I, I agree with you. Oh, and, I, yeah. and that's set forth in the health code's um, noise ordinance. And, in and terms tell of me that. again where that would be for this project. What, what, what would it be? Uh, yeah, we can you add it to my Yeah, it's it's measured 58 decibels at any point on a boundary that separates the commercial zone from a residential zone and this is section 9207C. Well, that's immediate. Right. I mean, that's, that's right like the boundary, so they the, the that it, it's there's there's four houses or so immediately south and they're residential. And yeah, that's where people, the boundary would Yeah, be. they're actual yeah. residential at the zoning boundary. And the zoning boundary for across the street would be at the front perimeter of the building. It would be in the middle of Remington Avenue. Is the zoning yeah, the no, no, no. You don't have zoning to the middle of the street. Yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> That's where the boundary, the boundary is. Boundary is located. Oh, I would want it to be from the, I'm sorry, I, I, forgive my ignorance. I did not know that. Really? So am I still allowed to park my car, commercial vehicle there? <laughs> my, my, so, okay, I didn't know that, and I'd like to, if you don't mind, if there's no objection, I'd like to, um, in the front, to, because that's who I'm thinking about also very much. We know the back boundary um, is right up against um, Fox, and it's small, it's narrow, but across Remington um, in the 2800 block, I would like to see the perimeter be the, the, the actual private property of the R house, if I could measure from there. But, and it's whatever would that you guys be okay? I mean, I think just for ease of administration, we'd like to stick with what's in the code because that's, you know. Well, what I don't know if that's, I think we can come up with whatever we want to come up with here. We can be specific. I, safe I, from the I mean, I've got this whole decibel thing and I went through this whole thing with the, like the, to the title. I mean, there was no specificity. I got a copy of the title, uh, the, the, the title of the noise. So when I got that, I said, I got free reign. So if I have it, can I please extend it just that much, but at least consider that? Thank you. And you know, I think we would like to have as much flexibility as possible, but the, we understand that the board might have the ability to look at the, uh, the length or the distance from the property at which the appropriate decibels could be heard. And my 6 p.m. is because of people coming home from work. So they'd have a shot to park in their own street, on their own block, um, before any group, you know, before the live music, whatever starts at 6. Uh, that's what I'm thinking of, is just really about parking. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's been great. Is that it? Um. Chad Weeks with the Greater Remington Improvement Association. Um, this matter came before our land use committee um, where they presented the entire proposal. It also came in front of our board and it came in front of our general body meeting at a meeting where I think about 60 people were in attendance. All three meetings we voted to support this. Um, we're really enthusiastic about it. We're trying to create a neighborhood that is more walkable, more livable, 
It has more live entertainment, more restaurants, more active nightlife and street life to create more eyes on the street to keep it to you know, make a safer neighborhood. Um, so we're, we're very supportive of this. We were supportive of it without any of these conditions being applied. Um, we were not aware of any of these conditions at the time of our approval of all these things, um, and we are very much in favor of it. As to the parking matter, the street actually has residential parking permits um, in that block, so it's, it's much less of an issue for neighbors. Um, they petitioned and got that. Um, we also have a feeling that the majority of this PUD is overparked. Um, the parking, I think, is frankly underutilized. A lot of people these days are taking Ubers or biking or walking to these establishments. That's stuff we want to encourage more of. Um, and we think this is an opportunity to further encourage stuff like that. So that's why we're very supportive of it. Okay. Thank you. Swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I go. Um, Josh Greenfeld um, with the Greater Urban Improvement Association. I'm board member and happen to be the chair of the Land Use Committee. Um, indulgences for being late. Um, we did take a vote on this in our general body meeting. It was, in fact, uh, unanimous. Nobody voted against it. Um, I also attended the RNA meeting, and there was no vote. So there's that. Um, as to the decibel issue, We've done some work trying to figure out what decibels are since this came up, and we got a decibel reader. As it turns out, this room is way more than 53 decibels right now. So they're going to need as much flexibility as they can because just the street noise. If we have a car riding by, we're going to be at 60, 70 decibels. So um, we'd encourage the, uh, the commission to put as few restrictions as possible on this life entertainment. I think it's a great use for the neighborhood. We're really excited about it. We want our businesses to do well. Um, we're actually in the process of trying to roll back some of the restrictions that have been put on our businesses in the past that make it really hard to do business. Um, so, you know, anything that can be, the commission can do to um, have as few conditions possible is really fantastic. We didn't vote on any conditions. We don't support any conditions. And the neighborhood is with us. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Um, I just, yeah, I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, I'm a bit at a disadvantage because there's been no testimony or evidence from the applicant. And when I said earlier that the applicant was Ms. Hecker, I was told I wasn't going to be able to question her. I have several questions to ask relative to the application. I prepared questions. They were written up as for being for applicant Carolyn Hecker because she did a test to the items on the application. So now with no testimony or evidence from anyone uh, other than Ms. Hecker herself, um, I'm, I'm a bit of at a loss as to how I'm going to proceed and do this if you won't allow me to a question Ms. Hecker herself, who did fill out the application. Um, and there's no one, there's no, no one from the, um, our house itself who has testified. And I do think we have uh, a dearth of evidence in the record right now to support this, to support this uh, application. What? So I, I, like I said, mostly I have specific questions relating to assertions that were made in the on the application. Well, maybe you can make your points in the way of argument. I will give it my best shot, but in the, b before I try to do that, there are two um, nearby residents who would like to speak, and they haven't got you know involved in these legal issues. That I, I l let them have a chance to say what they'd like sure. to say. Thank you. Please. Hi, Kathleen Hallowell. I'm a neighbor. And uh, I have a concern for um, how you, many. Where, where do you live? 2721 North Howard Street. Okay. And I have a concern about um, the uh, entertainment being seven nights a week. Um, there are families that have infants and children. There are people that uh, meditate. There's a yoga center right above the, uh, the place. And I think that it would be appropriate to have some days off where there is no entertainment perhaps uh, just having entertainment Thursday through Saturday. That's my thought. Okay, thank you. Sir? Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Matt Petras, 2736 North Howard Street. Uh, I am opposed to the outdoor live entertainment. Um, well, the gentleman gave the uh, example of a car going by your house being louder than 58 decibels. 
it, that's just a single instance. Imagine if that sound was constant for four hours. Uh, there have been instances where I've been on, where I've been in my living room, and I can hear people on their front porch uh, across the street at nine at night. Uh, we do have this thing uh, in the area called the neighborhood nuisance law, where we can call the police, and the police will come and uh, compel the party that is responsible for the nuisance to quiet down or face a fine at that point. Um, so, in terms of creating a nuisance of noise outside. Uh, I feel it will do that for many people, not just in the direct vicinity, but <clears throat> will also extend past that. Um, there were instances where people were across the street from me. If I'm at 28th and Howard Street and they're across <clears throat> the 28th Street side, a block down, and they're playing a radio in their backyard, and I can hear it, I've gone over and asked them to turn their radio down because I didn't feel it was appropriate. Um, I go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. Um, I would certainly like time to wind down before that because I have to wake up at four in the morning to, so I can be at work by five o'clock in the morning. Um, I feel as though those evening hours are time for rest and relaxation for members of the neighborhood. Um, and there was a time in my life where I certainly felt different. I'm 37, I wasn't always this age. I was once in my 20s myself, like most of, like all of us were. Um, I also didn't envision myself still being in Charlesville or Charles Village, Remington area. Um, this far, I imagine that I would have met somebody, settled down and moved to the suburbs. Well, here I am. I'm also different in my mentality because of it and I'm older and more mature now. And I do enjoy peace and quiet during the evening hours. And uh, I would certainly hope that uh, the R House establishment would be able to respect that. And where do you live? Uh, 2736 North Howard Street. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what I'm, what, how I'm going to do this, I think, is I'm going to um, reiterate the, the points made in my, in my motion and in my reply. I'm sticking to them, mm -hmm. okay? I wanna do that first. Sure. And I wanna say that this whole thing has already gone through a conditional use process. It's called a PUD. That is a conditional use process which goes to the city council. And that decision was made in 2014. And you can see it on the, on the, in the um, sections that I cited in the PUD. It was already decided that, li that live entertainment with a restaurant would be a permitted use throughout the pod. It's already in there. And that is the f basis for my contention that this is not a, con this conditional use proceeding is a bit of a red herring and all the, I talk about conditions and days and times because when I read the pod, I see it's a permitted use and I see there is a question about 10 p.m. Well, on that point, <coughs> so, the applicant's perspective is that the um, that live entertainment um, is a uh, uh, live entertainment here is an accessory use. Um, it's accessory to the um, uh, to the restaurant use, and therefore doesn't have to comply with the requirement of, um, uh, doesn't have to comply with the requirement of, um, uh, enclosed, uh, of operating within an enclosed structure. Um, uh, that, that, that as a conditional use as well, um, the board has the authority to attach conditions to it as to the hours of operation and the location of it. Um, if it were the case that these uses were already approved and permitted under the PUDs. They could just go out there and start doing them now. Would the applicant then be correct under your elaboration that they could stop this hearing right now, walk outside and start having their live entertainment on their patio? And yes, sir. 
I mean, because it's already, it's been permitted under the PUD. I addressed this in my, in my reply. I specifically said on that last page that this issue would be, would go to the, back to the zoning administrator who would be specifically asked. Why would the zoning, why would they have to go to the He has to issue, he does have to issue a use and occupancy permit. Okay, for, in but, other, in other but words, if it's already well, permitted, wouldn't he have to? He would be bound, if it's permitted, Okay, and, and I did have this discussion with him. We mm -hmm. did have this discussion, a very friendly um, discussion, actually. And, and um, <coughs> the issue would be, what is being applied for? What is, what is the zoning administrator being asked to approve? Mm -hmm. And then once he knows what that is, then he makes these determinations. So for instance, my contention would be that they would get the live entertainment within limits they, they are trying to go outside those limits, which is, I believe, why they're trying to, to come here. But they're, he would be able to approve it within certain limits, just as he's already approved certain other things. Many things have been approved as use, of an, use and occupancy in this pod up to date. And um, wh one of the things I would just point out is, you know, um, it, well, Aside from looking at the scheme of the pub, which is so clear. So, so long as I, Mr. Veal was willing to sign off on the, uh, on the permit application, you'd be fine with that. As, I, this hearing as, as, I, said, as I said in my reply, I asked for a remand because what I said was he will approve what he will approve, and he and I already discussed this. He will approve well, what he will yeah, approve, and then went to that discussion. She had a discussion with him as well. I think she had the, the email with him. I was I was, in, she just didn't you know say very much. Frankly, just mm -hmm. no, you're wrong, Mr. Veal. But but I mean, what I'm trying to say is he would approve what he approved in the in the normal course of things, and then that approval, as always would be subject to that window during which someone could appeal it. If he said, you know, I can only approve this, I can, I can approve this seven days a week, but only until 10 p.m. is Hecker, and I can't give you anything after 10 p.m., then, he, then she would, first of all, I would agree with that completely. I would agree that that is exactly what he could do. In, in, the, in, in the indoor setting, as long as he thought the windows, and we're, you know, there's an issue on windows as well, but at any rate, I would say he's right. Now, if he, if she wanted to go for more than 10 p.m., she would have to appeal then to this board and say, well, he made an error. If, if I wanted it, you know, if, if he approved it till midnight and I wanted it to cut off to 10 p.m., then I would be, appear before the board on the same basis. We, each of us would have a right to appeal what he, what he did. Specifically as to the outdoor, um, frankly, I don't, see, I don't see them approving that at all down there. I really don't. And, and again, if that specific item was disapproved or approved, either way, it would be subject to appeal to this board to determine whether he had, he had made an error according to the code. Um, so that's, again, I have stated my position in my reply. I think I'm very clear about that. I do think that this, this is a case that needs to be remanded for these specific determinations. I think it's, um, um, I think one, one of the things I'd like to suggest is that, um, you know, when you look at if you're trying to say that some of the things in the V2 are actually subject to conditional use board approval, even though there's a PUD, that's what you're saying, and that's what appears to be the, the case here, then let's talk about a, a restaurant delivery service. Because restaurant delivery service is one of those things that's listed in the B2 as a conditional use that must come to the board. Now, I don't honestly see folks at our house coming to this board to ask to do delivery service. And I just, just one example of something that is written in there like that, and I think that it's, again, it's in the B2, it's not on the prohibited use list, I think they can do it. We've already been through a process, it's a PUD process, whether we love the fact they can do it seven days a week, whether we love the fact they can do it till, till 10 p.m., I think they can. And I don't think this board, frankly, will have the ability to do, you know, oh, we'll put conditions on it. Um, <coughs> I think the conditions are written into the pod already, and they have to be adhered to. And if somebody wants to change those conditions, then they have to ask for a pod amendment, and there's a process for that as well. Um, now, I hope I've answered your question. 
as you know, because I did write it, it, it is already written down. So I hope mm -hmm. I answered your question. Now, what I'd like to do. <laughs> now, the um, opposition, or rather, the appellant wrote in their opposition um, that they see the code um, or, or the PUD language as being different. They really see the language of the PUD as basically saying that. <coughs> Um, what's permitted in a B2 was permitted in the PUD. What's permitted as an accessory use in a B2 is permitted as accessory in, uh, within the PUD. What's permitted as conditional use is permitted as a conditional use within the PUD. So that it basically pulls into the PUD these various different types of uses. And in, it says that if it's conditional in B2, it's conditional here. And that's the yeah. alternative construction that they're proposing. It's an alternative construction. I don't think it's legitimate, and I don't think anyone Why, at the time of the enactment of the PUD, I think we all understood that what they were doing was going down to the B2, scooping up all those things except what is prohibited, then going to the B3, picking up some B3 issues and uses, and then picking up some M1 issues as well. So under, under this theory that you're, you're speaking of, M1 uses are permitted, but B2 conditional uses are, have to come to the board. It, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. It's not a logical construction. I think we, we all understood. It, no, no, when you put the word permitted at the top, ma'am, back up and clarify your position. Now you said that there were M1 uses mm -hmm. that you that are permitted within mm -hmm. the PUD mm -hmm. and B3 okay. uses. Okay, and so those and you said that. You think that it's illogical to do what? I think when you look at the way the PUD permitted uses, keep in mind also that that says these are permitted uses. That's what it says, permitted. It doesn't say anything other than permitted. It says permitted. It says the uses are permitted. It doesn't say that the following are all now permitted uses. It's a subtle but important difference. I, I don't it's saying that it's allowed, but it's not necessarily saying that it's allowed as a right. It's saying it's permitted. I don't think that has but That's one. your understanding. Your opposition is proposing an alternative understanding. Other than saying that you think that they're wrong, I'm asking you if you can provide something other than that. I think the PUD itself does that job pretty well. Okay. I think the way the PUD is laid out just does that job very well. Um, it and I just and I think we we all understood that at the time the PUD was was enacted. Frankly, I think it's a legislative intent, and um, that's and it says permitted. I mean that's what it just actually says. I'm going to look at it right now. Well, they just found it. The following uses are permitted in all areas within the plan unit development. Mm -hmm. To me, that's just about as clear as it gets. Um, so I'd like to, if I could, I'd like to move on from that, from that. Mm -hmm. That's my point, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. But I'm, I'm sort of compelled to try to respond to some other things. So um, I do want to ask, the, these are the questions, and I'm going to proffer this as the questions I had prepared for the applicant. The applicant doesn't seem to be available for questioning, so I'm going to proffer these questions and ask that you mark them, please. But I can, um, I can articulate them, perhaps, <laughs> and without being able to ask them. I was going to ask, uh, on what basis did the applicant assert um, that a restaurant, including live enter entertainment dancing, which is the use we're talking about, that in that use, the live entertainment and dancing part of the use is not a business use? So that was, that was one question I was going to ask. Um, the next question was, on what basis do you assert that the, there is no park within 300 feet? That was a um, assertion made on the application. And I don't think there's any evidence in the record to back up that assertion. Uh, in fact, there is a park. Uh, it's the Fox, we call it the Fox Street Plaza, and um, it's at 28th and Fox Street, and that is within 300 feet. I was going to ask on what basis do you assert that the closest residence is 100 feet away? I don't think there's adequate evidence in the record to, to support that assertion. Um, the, um, the width of the right of way on Remington Avenue is 90 feet. The front wall of the houses is right on the property line. And in fact, 
the uh, outdoor table area extends into the right of way, maybe as much as 20 feet, I'm not exactly sure. So we're talking about 70 feet away for Remington Avenue. Then there's Fox Street immediately behind. Then there's 20, 28th Street houses immediately to the south. There are houses on 29th Street to the northwest. So I was, uh, again, and then on what basis do you assert that 65 houses are within 300 feet? Because again, I don't know that we have evidence in the record to support that assertion. Um, I was very interested in asking on what basis do you assert that the restaurant has more than 400 square, 400 off street parking spaces when the entire bud has much less than that number? Now that question was partially answered by Ms. Hecker. She admitted that there are 300 and a couple, uh, 300 and change at the PUD. But Ms. Hecker um, asserted that there are 98 spaces either leased or in control of the applicant in a nearby lot and I didn't see any evidence, at least I don't think I was handed any, any agreement that, that would um, back up that assertion. And um, unless I missed something, I believe that would have to be, that document would have to be in the record uh, and we'd have to be able, the board would have to be able to look at that and, and so, would, so, would, so would I, frankly. Um, I haven't seen any agreement to that effect. I believe there is a temporary use agreement, limited and temporary, um, but I think in order to make the assertion that's made here, it would have to be backed up by, by a document. Um, so I think there's insufficient evidence there. Um, and then going along with that would be just the, uh, uh, on what basis do you assert the you know, control of the spaces in, in the parking lot, the police parking lot at 242 West 29th Street? Because again, I don't believe we've had anything, any testimony or evidence that, that demonstrates that control or that permanence. I was going to ask, um, on what basis do you assert that the soundproofing of ceilings and windows will mitigate the impact of outdoor live entertainment and dancing? Because I don't think has anything to do. One thing has anything to do with the other. Soundproofing is 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 about buildings. Um, I was going to ask. Um, if your intention is to use live entertainment and dancing as an enhancement to the dining experience as opposed to the drinking experience, what dining experience is going to be offered after 10 p.m.? Um, I think that's something that, that we would need to hear as to what, what kind of restaurant um, is going to be um, uh, conducted, restaurant use is going to be conducted after 10 p.m. Um, I have some other questions that arose while I was listening. I'd like to get to those. Um, I have two pictures and I can, actually it's, I'll just say one picture and I'll give a copy to Ms. Hecker. Um, this is a picture that I took, uh, personally, you're welcome, uh, in a nice, nice day in April um, from the street. And it shows, I believe, the, the nature of the windows and the, we call them the rolled up windows or the rolled up doors. So that is the type of, of um, uh, structure we're talking about. And I think there, there is a question, I think there is a real question as to whether this type of um, window or door is, the, uh, is what's called for in the, um, in the code for an in enclosed structure, which is the, um, the, the terminology used is normal windows and doors pierced only by normal windows and doors. So I think there's a question there. But I think also the board is kind of on, you know, is aware of an issue there anyway. Um, I wanted to note to the board that after the uh, planning department representative spoke, um, Ms. Hecker was asked whether the applicant agreed to certain conditions. Planning department representative did say that the R bar portion of this premises must close at 10 p.m. I found that to be interesting, and I found that to be something that would, would need to be explored, and, and I didn't hear Ms. Hecker actually respond to that particular issue, uh, but that is what um, the gentleman did say. I've spoken about the lease agreement not being in the record. Um, I think, again, I'm not acknowledging that this is a conditional use process, but I'm having to respond to it so you all understand that. I do think that the, um, 
lack of a stage, you know, designated stage. I think the application, uh, if you're going through a conditional use process, you are supposed to say where the stage is. And I think we have a sort of a fluid situation here. Um, and then just for my own, I guess, final, and I, and I hope that we're not going to get all the testimony in rebuttal because I think it's extremely unfair. I think they have to make their case first. But I do believe that I um, uh, will hear this, and I think Mr. Bonaventure was, was right when he mentioned how sound is, and Mr. Washington as well. Sound is really funny, and we hear sound from very far away. Um, and so I do expect to hear the uh, music coming from this site if it is out of doors. But as I've said many, many times, I don't think there's any, any ability of this board to grant it out of doors. So I think that's enough for me to say right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief in response. I do want to respond to a couple of points that were made. Um, the first relating to the um, uses that are permitted in the PUD, and I think um, Mr. Washington touched on it, that in the PUD it, it specifically permits uses as allowed in the B2 district, which, you know, be they conditional or accessory, they are as they are allowed in the B2 district. This is consistent with how many, many, many other PUDs are drafted and how they've been interpreted historically. This was not particular or special or different language that was selected for this PUD, it's consistent with how they've all been done across the board. Um, on that point, Mr. French, is there any input from the planning department on that? <clears throat> we would defer <laughs> to the legal experts and the language states that in accordance with the revisions of Title IX, subtitles one and four, the following uses are permitted in all areas within the planned unit development, colon, A, all permitted accessory and conditional uses as allowed in the B2 zoning district with the following maximum retail hours of operation, which are then specified. So the whole question turns on that phrase, as allowed in the B2 districts. And the zoning department, oh, excuse me, planning department is not either the zoning administrator or the law department, and therefore we would seek outside advice on that question. Okay, are there um, other, um, Are there any other PUDs that have similar language that you can draw on as far as the, um, whether or not the planning department believes that those are permissible or, um, uh, or uh, uses which are conditional and have to be still approved by the board? Unfortunately, I don't have the knowledge to answer that question. Right. I apologize. That's okay. Just a question. I mean, on that point, I can tell you that we have been before this board on conditional uses in other PUDs where the language is, is identical on the board. And I think what Mr. Veal did in this case was treat this the same way it is usually treated, which is to send it to the board because it's a conditional use in B2, and that's what the PUD provides. Um, uh, may I rebut or respond to that? Because I'm the, we have, we, I you just reminded the board that we do have Mr. Veal's email after whatever happened initially, and he does agree that it's a permitted use. And that email was not written with the benefit of hearing both sides of the argument, and I don't know that Mr. Veal, how he would feel one way or the other today. Suffice it to say, Mr. Veal denied something. Subsequently, there was an exchange between Ms. Floyd and Ms. Veal. Ms. Floyd believes that Mr. Veal changed his determination. The record reveals that the, that he did not rescind the denial of the application and therefore it arrived here. Is that roughly correct? That is perfectly fair. Okay. So whatever exchange that occurred between Ms. Floyd and Mr. Veal apparently wasn't sufficient for him to withdraw his <coughs> denial. Correct, which brings us to the zoning board. Um, and just on the issue of the application, just so that the record is clear, the applicant is listed on the application as our house licensee LLC. I am not personally the applicant, and I have signed the application as having the specific approval of the owner to file the application, which is what was done. Um, 
parking was raised in um, Ms. Floyd's um, testimony. It, parking is really not an issue here. Live entertainment doesn't add additional off-street parking requirements. The, par the uh, PUD um, provides, I think, 303 parking spaces, which exceeds the 161 spaces that are uh, required, and this board has heard that case extensively several months back. Um, so I, I don't see parking as being an issue here at all. Um, Mr. French, in his report, mentioned a 10 o'clock closing time for our bar, the uh, the uh, bar portion of our house. Um, I believe that that is a typo. I think our bar is part of our house restaurant, which is in the um, the restaurant use concept. That I, I believe is a a mistake um, because that was always intended to be part of the restaurant. It operates as one restaurant. Um, and I see Mr. French is waving over there. The language in the planned unit development ordinance states, within the planned unit development, the following alcoholic beverage licenses are permitted. Now skip A to B. A total of not more than one class A beer, wine, and liquor license, which in area B may not in the licensed establishment include bulletproof security barriers between staff and customers, may not contain lottery machines, and must voluntarily agree to abide by 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. hours of operation, period. This is actually in part A, the part that you skipped. It's a class B license, not a class A license. Very well. Um, we didn't know a the class, a license, know the class a, of license. A class A license is a packaged goods store. A class B license is a restaurant license. Um, so that may clarify that issue for us. Um, let's see. Uh, with regard to the issue about the type of doors, I don't really see that as being here or there. Um, there was a permit issued for restaurant use. The plans examining office looked at the type of, perm of uh, doors that were proposed and determined that this door and window system creates an enclosed use for the restaurant. Um, you know, I think what we've heard, oh, there was a question um, by one of the um, other community um, opponents about how many times a week we are going to have live entertainment events, and I realize that I, I may have glossed over that as part of our um, case in chief here. Um, we, it's indicated in our application, and we are only planning to have live entertainment only one to three times a week. This is not intended to be an every night event. Um, you know, we like the flexibility to change up what nights that might be. I mean, we may have a Tuesday night trivia, and then you know, a Friday evening band, and then a Sunday brunch, um, you know, event. So it. it we don't know, it may not necessarily be Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, but um, it would be more than three nights a week. Would, would not be more than It would not be more than three nights a week. Would you be willing to have that as a condition that you could move your nights, but it wouldn't be more than three nights? How about, it, it, let, me, let me propose a counter proposal at you. If it was um, on average no more than three nights a week. So if, for instance, there was some particular week where there might be you know, a need to have multiple, more than, more than three events, there might be four events that week, but two events the following week. But on a monthly basis, would average no more than three events a week, or call it 12 events a month. Um, that I think we could live with. Just we're trying to build in a little bit of flexibility. Um, but we're certainly not intending to have it um, every night during the week. So. Um, you know, I think just to conclude, the board has a lot of discretion here to attach a lot of, of conditions. The board can determine where the outdoor, um, where the, the live entertainment can occur, whether it's indoors and outdoors, and where within the establishment it can occur. It can set hours of operation, um, and frankly, attach pretty much any other condition it wants to. One thing I would mention, I forget who raised it in um, the testimony, but one, oh, I guess it must have been Councilwoman Clark, was concerned about the future operators and who may, um, who may buy this property at some point in the future, we would accept a condition that limited it to this um, particular operator or owner um, sure. because, you know, we don't... Yeah, me either. Uh, <laughs> I beg your pardon? So I'm not sure if we can do that. Okay, well, we, you know, I, I'm putting that out there that we would, we would not object to that type of condition because we are not concerned about some future operator. As a practical matter, we would have to go to the liquor board anyway if the property were transferred because we'd have to transfer the liquor license and they certainly would have the authority to attach whatever conditions they wanted to on the live entertainment piece. So, so that, may, that may be an issue without it. Figure a zoning hearing. That's correct, right. 
the, uh, the exchange between you and Mr. French, can you go back over here? You said it's a class what license? It's a class B license. A class B is a restaurant license. A class A is a packaged goods store license. Okay. Um, it was originally, when we did the PUD, originally contemplated that there might be a packaged goods store component. There isn't in the PUD. And if there were, we would agree to, we agreed at that time that we would limit the hours um, as set forth in the PUD. But this is a class B license, which authorizes by right um, sales from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. of alcoholic beverages. We have agreed to limit that to midnight in um, section three of the PUD, which sets the hours of operation for the restaurant to uh, close at midnight. Uh, so with that, um, we would request that the board approve the live entertainment, um, attaching whatever conditions the board finds to be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Sure. Uh, I'll take a two minute recess. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> all right. And we're going to go back on the record. We'll call 2017 101 17 North Chester Street. Travis Lockman. Gentlemen, if you can, gentlemen, if you can heed my advice from earlier and take your discussion outside, please. Thank you. All right, you're Mr. Lockman? I am. Okay. We have this an application to construct a third floor rear addition and rooftop deck onto a to be used as three story single family attached dwelling. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. If all those intending to give testimony can please raise their right hands and be sworn. You swear or affirm, Mr. Lockman, you want to raise your hand? Sorry. You swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Staff reports, please. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Okay. Is that on staff report? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Lock, um, why don't you tell us about what's being proposed here? Sure. So we have a, um, a three-story dwelling that's on Chester Street. Um, it's currently three stories. The, the third floor is a, existing at 20 feet long. And what we're proposing is to take that third story um, another 35 feet so it's the same um, length as the first two levels, the mm -hmm. first and the second. So we essentially just want to square it up. And I think it's worth noting that the property um, sort of narrows at the rear by about two and a half feet. So it's 16 feet wide, these properties, and um, at, the, at the rear, the addition is 13.6. We're proposing to keep it in that n more narrow footprint all the way to the edge of the uh, the line there of the first and second stories. Oh, you said the property tapers in? Yes, it does. Hmm. We don't show that on the The, um, not, not within sort of the property lines, but the structure itself. Oh, the structure does. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, you had an opportunity to speak with your opposition? I did. Okay, and did you guys get anything worked out? Um, I think we're <clears throat> sort of at somewhat of an impasse at this point, and this is, I think each party is hoping to just sort of continue through you guys to see what okay, we can do. Sure. All right. Sir, your name, please? My name is Jerry Bembry. Okay, and ma'am, your name? <clears throat> okay, you can step forward and use that microphone. Okay. Yeah, um... The concern that we have, I mean, we, we bought this property in 1988. You said uh, this property. You're not talking about the subject. The, the, the property there, the uh, 19 North Chester Street. I mean, we're not talking about the subject. We're right next door. Okay. All right. Um, there's a narrow opening that separates uh, the two properties. So it's Like a breezeway? Very, excuse me? There's a breezeway between the yeah, two? Yeah, a little walkway. There's a fire escape that it connects both properties. Mm -hmm. uh, very very little sunlight. I mean, we, if, if you guys are familiar with, with Butcher's Hill, uh, long-term residents, you know, it wasn't always Butcher's Hill. When we bought the property back in 1988, you know, we dealt with a lot of stuff over there, prostitution, drugs, and, you know, we invested in the community. And a lot of people have made improvements on those houses over there uh, without increasing the footprint in the back. 
we're concerned about the natural light that comes in. Uh, it would make it a very dark space in the back. Uh, since their property comes right next to ours, the second floor will pretty much eliminate any sunlight that comes in. Uh, we've had some stucco prop, uh, problems on our property, maybe seeping in with, uh, through, the, through gutters that we just had recently replaced. But, you know, we're also concerned, too, with that direct sunlight coming in that, you know, it, it helps keep that uh, dry. And there could be some issues later on. I mean, it, basically, the concern is that uh, a lot of people have invested in those properties and on outside of the block. And we're, we, we might be the longest existing co uh, uh, owners on on that street. And again, we've endured a lot. And people have come in and renovated properties and kept the existing footprint. Um, I know, uh, your name, Travis? Mm -hmm. I, I think Travis said that, you Mr. know. Mr. Monkman, you, just so that you folks know. So there's two microphones up there. Um, one is for each <laughs> side sure. there. Yeah. You don't need to sort of disappear in the background. Well, you well, you know, there. And I, I think, you know, Travis says that, you know, they have investors who come in and they want to, you know, keep the value and when they resell, you know, they want to get, they want to maximize their profits. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying that we've been there for a long time and hopefully you'll take in consideration that we've been long time owners there. And again, we've endured the good and the bad in that neighborhood and we appreciate everything that's going on. Everybody on outside of the street has kept the existing footprint when they've redone the properties. There's one property at the corner that um, maybe 30 years ago extended that property out. But we've had, I think three or four renovations on that side of the street and they've kept the existing footprint. And we just ask to keep the existing footprint and not affect our property. Okay. And your concern is with light coming in? It's light. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 it would make that a very dark opening in the back um, with, the, with the addition of the third floor. And also the potential, you know, uh, that side wall on the stucco and spent uh, thousands of dollars actually to go back and repair it and i'm sure there are still additional pockets that probably need to be repaired but without that sunlight the wall will, doesn't dry out well mm -hmm. and so we would have to continue to have that wall prepared and this, this is our first time before a meeting so i wish we could have brought multiple photographs and everything yeah, I, I have a picture of the property here that kind of shows the opening and the existing rooftops and I'm, I'm sure that doesn't help you guys right now i wish i could hand it out to you but it is an indication i can pass it around if you want to see it Sure, you can. Um, and just so that we're clear, we've got an aerial here. Okay, you, you probably have the same thing. Um, so, you the same. so your property is this one right here? We're, we're 19, so I don't know. I think, that, I think this is the one we're talking yeah, about. <laughs> and then you are here, I believe. I think we are here, here and their property is there. The property okay. we're talking about is that black rooftop. Okay. okay. And we're, All right. we're to the right. Okay, so you're right there. And this is on North Chester Street. That's correct. So Chester obviously running north-south. Yes. Your property, the front faces the west and the faces back west. faces the east. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that addition would be on the south side, so, you know, the south side. And yeah, I mean, yeah, that would yeah. be. Although with being on the south side, the... Oh, I see here. Looks like there's no, it's the only window I'm seeing in here in the back is that one right there, is that correct? Yeah, I, uh, sure. I cited 54, 54, sure. So. Um, that's the only window right, right there in the back? Yeah, and then but there's- But there's, there's the, windows in the side, so yes. there's, there's, that's the, uh, our kitchen window on the third floor, there's a window on the second floor, and there are windows on the inside of that property too. So the first floor windows and the second floor windows are also inside, which probably about Eight feet away from his, the windows on their property as well. Yeah. So we're everything will be impacted by that addition. That going up would impact the, all the light that's coming to the side. Okay. All right. Anything further? That's it. That's it. Okay. Ms. Lockman. I guess a couple of um, points. You know, with with first of all, we like to reach out to uh, the, the folks at least adjacent to the properties that we're building as a, a standard practice. Um, and we did that in this case. Um, so the neighbor on, to, on the other side of the building at 15, 
mm -hmm. was able to provide us a letter of support, mm -hmm. um, which I have. I don't know if you guys got a copy of that, but I have it here in front <coughs> of me, so I can pass it around if you guys would like Do to see it. Do you have anything in the file on that? No. Can I, can I answer that uh, quickly? People in 15 are imp impacted. Yeah. Um, and the letter, you, you can talk, speak about the, talk about, the, tell them about the letter that you received that the check, whatever was checked. No, it just said, the letter just said, um, check off if you approve, you know, if you have no opposition, then won't be, you know, following any opposition. And so I never sent the letter, so, you know, I had, because I had opposition to it. Right, I guess, um, I, from what I recall, and I could be wrong, but I try to put my contact information with questions or any. But if it's just a checkpoint, if you oppose, yeah, that, okay, that, that's, that's that's what the that's and what I read. And then that's fine. I, you know, that's that's fine. We're and again, the uh, the issue on uh, 15, which is one of the houses that was renovated as well, where they did not change the footprint of the building, so it's exact. It's pretty much the same footprint as the, the properties that are there right now. So and they're not impacted by the sunlight. We don't have that opening that separates the two of us. Sure, sure, sure. The the opening, um, I guess, is another piece. I think that's worth discussing. So right now. The existing footprints, as I understand it, for both of our buildings are the exact same thing, right? Like, yeah, as they exist pretty now, much, with, pretty much. with a gap between our third store, our existing third stories, mm -hmm. um, as and especially where the building narrows out in the back, the first and second levels are separated by five feet or so, two and a half feet on either side of the property line. That's uh, I, I've never measured it before, but it sounds about could be okay. Right. So in that scenario, and I guess this is one of the factors I'm trying to consider is. Our third story, I don't see it being as impactful as you guys are mentioning, <laughs> only because what is it, what is it covering? You, yeah. There's nothing, there's a second story and a first story that we both have currently that are only five feet away from each if other. If you take at the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. If we can just clarify a, a couple of things that I think are sort of important to bear out. Um, this is in an R8 zoning district. Um, and the drawings show that the height of the building that is up to the top of the third floor, or the proposed third floor, is 31 feet, four and a half inches. Okay, that's the height. From the back, it's gonna be 27 feet, because there's a slope. And an R8 zoning district, um, one has the absolute right to build to 35 feet. Um, so the third floor addition here is being less than 35 feet, um, is being built as of right. Um, so there's no variance, there's nothing needed for that approval. So then the question comes, well, why are we here? Um, here on the deck, because the deck shows that it is at a height <laughs> of, mm, at least the base of the deck is probably somewhere around maybe 33 feet, but the required guardrail that's imposed by the building code reaches a height of 37 and a half feet. Actually, since it's a 42 high, a 42-inch guardrail, so that's three and a half feet. Take that off of 37. Yeah, it's about 33, 34 feet is where the base of the deck, the floor, so the floor of the deck is below the 35-foot um, uh, 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 limit, and it's only the only part that protrudes above that is the required guardrail around the deck. Um, the, typically, uh, the board, this was the case which is on the consent docket, it was not because you signed it in opposition to it, um, uh, but because the guardrail is something which is imposed by the code as opposed, well, it's imposed by the building code as opposed to um, uh, being, well, since it's something which is required by code, um, the board doesn't really count that as a intrusion into the space. Plus, it's also limited by the, uh, there is a uh, exception for protrusions above the 35 uh, foot level, um, which apply to basically you know, when you've got like an accessory structure or something that's just, that's just some small pop-up above that that doesn't create some sort of living space or something like that. And here, this is just the guardrail of the deck. 
So um, really we're here on a technicality relating to the deck, relating to the third floor, um, they can build that as of right. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that um, the orientation of Chester Street being north-south, the property being east-west, the front of the property being to the east, I mean to the west, rear of the property being to the west, sun rises in the east, goes by way of south to the west. So the direct sunlight that comes into your windows is in the morning when the sun rises and hits into your windows. It then um, disappears pretty quickly and at that point becomes indirect sunlight um, just as there's light during the daytime, that light comes into the um, comes into your home, um, but it's not direct sunlight. Um, uh, there's already, as far as the second and first floors you were talking about, that sunlight is pretty much already lost to the existing structure of the buildings, um, uh, and so the third floor may cause some kind of diminution in that, but it's really not going to be that significant in addition. There's nothing that we can do to say that they can't build that. That's sort of the important thing there, is that they can build that as of right. So the only thing that we're really here on relates to the deck. Um, and even not so much the deck itself, but rather the guardrail that's being required. Um, so that's really the only thing that the board can do as far as our input or our say over what's being proposed in the drawings. Okay. Mr. Lockman. Um, yeah, I guess with that sort of in mind, I mean, you know, for just for the benefit of you guys too, like I, we, we always do our best to work with folks in the community and, you know, one thing that I'd be legitimately interested to see based on what other discussions we've had so far is just to truly understand the impact of that third level to your sunlight because just based on the understanding of how close those those two buildings currently <coughs> are and the fact that you don't you know what we mentioned the, the path of the sun I kind of believe also that the impact may be less than what what you're considering now you know I say sunlight I say moonlight I say the lights to the buildings and we can see what we can see outside our back windows which will be greatly diminished by building this and I, I understand we we can't say anything about that because they're under code but I'm just saying that those are our concerns and okay. thank you all very much Thanks. All right. Two thousand seventeen dash one twenty nine twenty seven hundred through twenty seven thirty two May Street, Michael Burton. that there was opposition in this case there is um so i just wanted to go through a couple things and then we'll go from there so uh, well you wait, can wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay so who signed they the opposition in this sure, case sure they can come up just because everybody has to get sworn in and absolutely All those intending to give testimony can raise their right hands and be sworn, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Um, and Mr. Burton, we have this an application to consolidate 2700 and 2732 May Street streets, subdivide uh, the lots into 14 lots, and construct 14 three-story single-family attached dwellings with second floor rear balconies, rear access, lower level, two car garages, and rooftop decks accessed from stair top penthouses. Is that correct? That's the correct. Okay, and do we have staff reports? Chair, no, be 
Wait, hold on. <laughs> hold on a second. Are you postponing the case? We are. Oh. I wanted to get a couple things on the record before we postpone. <laughs> so let, okay. I'd like to hear from Mr. French. All right. Planning Department has reviewed this application, noted that subdivisions require approval by the Planning Commission, and therefore any determination by the Board should be subject to the condition that the final development is built according to the subdivision and development plans that are approved by the Planning Commission. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mr. Burton. Okay. Just a couple of housekeeping things, and then I'll get right to Sharon's points so you're okay. Sure. Um, so first of all, um, I was contacted by Mr. Tanner um, that the place was not posted mm -hmm. um, and I had been checking it every day so I thought vandalism happened mm -hmm. so I went up and noticed that my posting was still there we followed all the posting procedures with the f that BMZA has mm -hmm. um, and then and I so I'd taken a new sign with him Mr. Tanner I called him and I said the sign's still here and he said well actually they were saying there was supposed to be they wanted two signs on the property however you're only required one sign with an abundance of sort of uh, you know basically trying to make sure that we're not doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. I took the other signs that I had already made and put it on the other lot. So there's two signs on the lot, just so that was for the record that I had done that. Okay. Um, second, that we have worked with the, um, the CVCA um, multiple meetings. I think I spoke for a total of 10 hours in those meetings, asking, que answering questions from the community. From the community. Um, and we have garnered the CVCA's support However, um, we were notified basically seeing other opposition letters coming in over the weekend and through email. And so seeing that, um, which kind of appears here today, seeing that um, we basically have retained counsel, okay? And so that, and he could not be here today. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is that um, we sincerely want to make this go right. Um, most of the neighbors here are from uh, the 2700 block of Howard Street, so they're impacted the most because they're directly behind us. Mm -hmm. So we're willing to meet with them uh, again prior to coming back to the to this board. Um, and we spoke in the hall about that. And to the point where um, the application that we put in from that time through the meetings that we had, we have uh, been modifying the design per uh, concessions that we've been giving to the neighborhood. That's why the, the appeal is different, Sharon, than what, what they said, than what we've been drawing. Um, and they still want us to give more concessions. We're not sure if we can, but we certainly are gonna listen to what their point is and see if we can't work it out with them. And so with that, um, we basically are asking for a continuance of the hearing to just basically we'll come back. Um, once we've met with them, I think that with Brian uh, here, one of the, I think, what's, what's your address, Brian? 20, 27, the uh, resident of 2727 um, Howard Street, North Howard Street. Um, basically, um, we set a time frame somewhere late um, May to early June to meet prior to coming back to here. So then we'll reorganize and get back to the board at that time. Does that sound? And that's basically, that's, that's all I have to say. So we'll amend, our application will ultimately be amended by all these comments and get in. So what will ultimately be there will come back in once I've had these meetings with the community. Okay. That's it. All right. If I may, I mean, speak to the mic. Were this postponement, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Matt Petrus, 2736 North Howard Street, where the postponement is coming in. Uh, while uh, Mike th and the developers or the people of Urban Design Group have met with us, uh, what was proposed to us, we had raised objections to. Uh, we had stated uh, where we stood, and he had offered concessions that were ancillary to what we were uh, willing to accept but did not meet what we were willing to accept, which is where this postponement is coming in. So right. while he was offering, say, a block of cheese, and we said, no, you have to cut that block of cheese in half, he was chipping away at the edges of it, edges of it as a metaphor. Okay. Um, and so we're willing to meet with them one more time to see if we can't work this out. Okay. All right. 2017-129-2700. Um, uh, and 2732 Nace Streets uh, is postponed. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Excuse me. We, uh, I have not emailed my letters, but I would like to give it to you to add to the record. Okay. If you want to just look down at the end there. No, ma'am, ma'am, we're not on the record. If you oh, want to okay. just go down there and hand whatever it is okay. you would like to hand up, if you can. Okay. His orange tie on. I like yours better. Does David have one on? No. Oh, okay. What's that? I couldn't remember Brandon. if you had an Orioles tie on too, but no, no I this got is my just city tie. these three. Are. <laughs> I wear this all the time. Okay. Yeah, yours appears longer because mine has a <laughs> circumference issue. <laughs> <laughs> I thought yours was more airy to cover up. <laughs> it, just, it, it would touch my belt if it were not for well, you just need the chicken tie, box. You need to do the, uh, the Donald Trump and just get, you know, the tie that hangs right. down to your knees. The bad towel tie. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, yes. Yes, what? Was that accessory to the hotel use or accessory to the restaurant use? Matt, yes. Matt, Matt's one of them. Just talk a minute. No. Okay. That appeal went through as the hotel use. Okay. That's why it fell outside. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's different. Um, look, because what I think what the, um, what the, yes. Um, because of the concern was really just in terms of precedential value. And so mm -hmm. it's different when you're talking about it's accessory to a hotel use versus, you know, if you're talking about accessory to a restaurant use, then you have everybody. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, moving on. Oh, well, not really moving on, because uh, we're talking about the same thing, presumably, unless there's something else anyone else wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants to talk about Chester Street? <laughs> A block of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be <laughs> one we'll never forget. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so bad. Bad. I've never heard that one before. Okay. Um, I'm going to use my negotiating cheese. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. All right. Um, Outdoor, indoor, I don't think that outdoor is permitted. I don't know if anyone else has any strong feelings in that regard. Yeah, I, I, I'm on the same page with you. I, I, I'm okay with the proposal except for the outdoor entertainment. Yeah. Um, the, you know, I, I think that, um, did they ever say, I guess as far as where to measure the sound from, I never got a clear answer on that. Yeah. They were wanting to they stick wanted to with stick what with the health code says. Yeah. 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 Which yeah. is basically the middle of the street. street. Yeah. Which I, you're talking I'm about five sure. feet one direction or another, or ten. Yeah. But I can't believe the decibels have dropped. I would need to confirm that because I always thought it was like That's from the so much per feet. property line. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I and, was uh, assuming it was property yeah. lines. So, or I've heard things like 10 feet. Yeah. The questionnaire says 10 feet. Yeah, the questionnaire says you measure 10 feet from any that's point of the structure. structure. That's right. Um, it's, yeah, I know what they're trying to do. It's tough to enforce no matter what. It's a major problem. Uh, the health department 
rarely, if ever, enforces it. But um, that's where we took our, when we developed that questionnaire with the zoning administrator's office in the 40 to 80 decibel range, that all came with consultation from the health department and review of the, the code. So I don't know where Caroline's interpretation of that came from. I'd like to research that a little bit. And haven't there been a requirement that where there are bars or restaurants that are having live entertainment that they can't have like windows and doors open and that has in the past been a condition that was placed on restaurants that had a door the, the windows mm -hmm. that open to the street there's been a condition that they be closed during live entertainment i don't think it's a law what okay. happens on federal hill mothers and all those um they have to be closed with mothers it's not really in it's a really mothers issue has uh, the well, they don't have a sliding door. purple patio mm -hmm. <laughs> which <laughs> operates in that other zone. Yeah, and that has its own zoning <laughs> <laughs> That actually was approved by the board years ago uh, about allowing that. Um, I, I could get the <laughs> case file. <and laughs> the reason okay. we always assume for the rule about closing doors and windows mm -hmm. was decibels louder inside. Yes, that's right. Maybe outside still met that's the right. The health department yeah, doesn't, they don't care how loud it gets inside. inside. It's what right. escapes right. Out, outside. outside. That and that was kind of my point is that the, you know, my understanding of how that whole thing came to pass was that it was seeking to strike a compromise to allow the activity inside of establishments, but with the intent of minimizing its effect on the surrounding communities outside of it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, particularly in these kinds of areas where you've got this commercial use that's abutting right up against, I mean, it's in the residential district. It's a PUD, so it can exist there, but traditionally, I, I think under code right that you're not allowed to have live entertainment in residential zones that's that's correct so the because it operates as a PUD it's an exception but well you know, it's, the underlying zoning is B3 though yes well that's what I mean is that it's sort of this carve out in the middle of yeah. a residential area so when, True. when you couple that with the fact that the vast majority of the community is in support does it that sway it um, well, two things <laughs> that um, they are now before it exists, um, but more importantly, it's in, you know, how do we deal with this going forward with each of the, you know, with, with pretty much every establishment. So, you know, when we're looking at the question of what's the one in uh, uh, Fells Point wanted the outdoor bar. Mm -hmm. Oh, County Court. Yes. Yeah. So you know their argument was, well, we have community support. We're a really good operator. Aren't we great? Why don't you let us do this? And it's that, well, yeah, sure, you might be, but everyone else is going to want what you get, um, which is why you know we've got them here because they think that, well, Pendry got live entertainment outside, even though they're a hotel and not a restaurant. Um, so why can't we have that? Um, so you know we have to sort of look at it much wider than that um, because it's something that other people are going to be looking for as well. So where where is live entertainment allowed in the city? Where do we have live entertainment? <clears throat> well, this is a putt, so it's, it operates a little bit differently, um, and. You know, the live entertainment is permissible. It's a B3 zone, as David pointed out. Um, so it's live entertainment is uh, conditional use there, so you can have it. Um, the question then becomes, okay, what conditions do we want to put on it? And here, they're seeking to have it outside. So 
Yeah, if we're going to say no to that, I don't think that it's allowed in the code anyway. Um, then the turn, then it's like, okay, well, what other conditions do I mean, do we want to put on it? I have I'm with Frank that I have no real problems with their proposal. I mean, the councilwoman wants some limitations on hours, and um, I think she was fine with the days, right? Um, she wasn't. Yeah, she didn't say that. Yeah, I think that she just wanted to cut back on the hours. Um, but there was that whole part about the average and. That's too difficult to apply because yeah. then you got to have somebody who's keeping track. Yeah. And yeah. If you don't, if you don't say Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, or Monday, Monday Friday, yeah. and Saturday, then it gets. Oh, I did it four times last week. And, yeah. yeah, that's right. I mean, figuring out the average in a month, you then need to know each day that they did actually have it. And there comes a, oh no, you know, you had it two Thursdays ago. No, we didn't. We only had it on or in December Saturday. they didn't do it all so then they think they have 12 True. or whatever. that's right yeah, I know. yeah. That, that's not going to work no one of our standard conditions for my understanding is to hold the applicant or excuse me if they selected on their condition lease application yes if they click if they select it on the three unless the board excludes that or doesn't want that condition to be held to that what about the uh, trade off a little bit though if you're going to if you're not going to limit if you're not going to, if they can't go outside, sort of a trade off is you can say you can run seven days a week inside. Oh, well, yeah. And I think, that, I mean, I was thinking that we would go with, we got her letter here. I'm going to borrow it from you. Um, I was thinking that we would go with her suggestions as far as restrictions. So she was fine with um, Sunday. Monday through Thursday. Yeah, so she was fine with all days of the week. She wasn't even proposing to cut back on Saturday. She was only really proposing to cut back on Sunday, trim them back uh, as far as a start-up time but not ending time on Friday, uh, whatever they're proposing on Saturday, and then um, limit them during the week to 6 to 10 when they wanted 5 to 10. Um, so I was fine on the days and was thinking that we could limit the hours as she's requesting what she want to do. Um, uh, the noise requirements that's something they have to be complying with anyway under the health code um, and you know the whole business about the speakers being outside being directed inside and to say that we you know, yeah. no outside live entertainment and then when they're having live entertainment they have to have the um, uh, the doors and windows closed Speakers facing inward is sort of a. Yeah, and I don't know if I'd be that restricted. You're not going to have them facing out away from the crowd anyway. You're always going to push those in towards your crowd. Well, so yeah. And my thought is that it's sound bounces off of things. So just as much as Metallica was bouncing off of Anthem House and directing the sound back towards my house, I mean it's. <laughs> it's the same the sand, man. <laughs> Fortunately, it wasn't that clear. I don't think I'd be, uh, my position is I wouldn't be that restrictive. I think I would allow them to have the three garage doors open because I think that that's their concept. I think if you close those on a nice day, you're, you're, you're really messing with the concept of what they have. Well, I would limit them to the decibel zone. It's only the. Um, it's only when you're having live entertainment, though. Right. That's what I'm saying. I, I don't. I don't have a problem with them having those garage doors open and having live entertainment if they live with the decibel limits. Yeah, you because know, we said the decibel limits. You, sort there's of. There's no outside. reason you have to close it. The reason we have them is you can have it louder inside. Yeah. But the, also the reality is going to really David monitor. That. Yeah. Yes. That's I the mean, thing. I, well, who's going to really monitor? The windows are open with live entertainment, whether they're at 0 0.58 or 58 decibels or 63 decibels or whatever the number is. Yeah. I and Martin, 58 that. decibels is relatively quiet, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, see, the, the issue I have there is that, as David pointed out, it's not really something that's enforced by the health department. Don't um, do anything. So, the, yeah, so I, it's kind of worthless being there. Um, well, I will tell you, I mean, I've, I've been involved in a neighborhood situation where the neighborhood uh, hired their own sound yeah. engineer and they mm -hmm. went out with decibel meters and, and, and this is just becoming an affluent neighborhood. I would think these folks, if they had a problem, the neighborhood association would hire a contractor and say, yeah, here, you're, you're 85 decibels. 
And then what are they going to do? <laughs> then they would call uh, Mr. Veal and say, can you enforce this? He would call the health department and they'd say no. No, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but or you have private enforcement. There's, I mean, they um, can bring their own lawsuit. It, it's not impossible to enforce, but you need to build a case. And whatever means are necessary, sometimes you have to go to. They have apps now that measure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think that I don't think that it would be hard to privately have somebody do that. Mm -hmm. But I, but I think that the way that that gets played out is that exactly as David said is that the community then um, uh, follows up by reporting as a violation to um, uh, to the zoning administrator's office, and then they need to have somebody act, some official go out and take the measurement, and that's the responsibility that falls on the health department, and they're not going to send anyone out. Well, it's the police aren't going to get involved. They can get code enforcement inspectors from the housing department to get the equipment and do it. If it becomes a major problem, I mean, they don't, they wouldn't be out there every weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if the complaints are such that this is a major problem to the neighborhood, they would have to take some kind of enforcement plan. Uh, well, no, it's not I, easy, I, but it can be done. Well, the neighborhood I think it's just to, easier just to say that. I kind of think that having the windows open is the, is the, you might as well, just the equivalent of having speakers outside. That's right. The, the, the noise level is not going to be, you know, lessened by just saying the speakers are inside, but we yeah. have these roll up windows open. It's the right. same thing. So. Yeah. And I'll say that I'm losing this one. Ah, I like because I, was, I wasn't going to play with outside. So I kind of like the idea of rolling up the window. And well, the calling, other thing I would point out is that when we did, to, um, I guess it's now Wayward Bar and Grill, whatever it is, it's next to Mother's. And they have um, the front there is um, same kind of thing. They have a roll up window yeah, you're right, front. And we said that you can do that, but and then they, they wanted live entertainment and outdoor table service. And we said that they that they can have the live entertainment, but that has to be down. But that wasn't a putt. Uh, that whether it's in a putt or not is that doesn't really make a difference. They can. Um, I think actually it's less of a difference there because that's not even a residential district. If if they can't live with it, they can try to amend the putt. Through an ordinance. Yeah, it's, it's, I was thinking it's sort of the same thing. I mean, if Mary Pat doesn't like what we have done here, she can always go to the city council and change it. I think it would more probably more come from the property owner mm -hmm. if they don't if they can't live with whatever conditions are put on them, they can try to change it. But um, and obviously they don't want to have to go through that. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what the new code's going to bring us. <laughs> well, we'll wait until next month. Uh, are there any others? So where, where were we with the hours? Uh, hours. I would go with Mary Pat. The hours. Yeah. The six o'clock. Yeah. Six o'clock. What is that? Is relative? Is if we're not going to have outside music or the whole thing with the parking? What? No, the parking wasn't one of the issues. That no, that was her issue for well, making it six o'clock instead of five o'clock. Yeah, uh, so people coming here, the music wouldn't take up all of the neighborhood's parking space. Right. Parking but space. if it's contained inside and, and all that stuff, is that as much of an issue? Probably not. I, but still music. I, yeah, I still, I still. Just as much of an issue. Yeah. Still music. It's just music that must be contained, contained. Mm -hmm. inside. That's right. Designed to draw more people. Well, people yeah, I mean, that's the reason why you have it. It's not to serve your existing customers. It's so that more people will come in. <laughs> and there is still the winter where the windows will definitely be closed, right? right. So, <laughs> most likely, you know. 
Um, um, well. Although, are since you did... going to monitor the door in that situation? Nobody monitors the door. It's no. Anybody who yeah. wants yeah. to go well, in a bar, yeah. Like, but yeah. Yeah. This is like a different concept than a bar, though. Mm -hmm. I haven't been up there. It sounds like a neat concept. Oh, it's like, just think yeah, about... Uh, all the restaurants. Vernon Marketplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's what I was thinking of, but yeah. yeah. It's like, uh, almost like Eatly. Here by your house. Yeah. What's Boulder it called? Square. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went in there, I couldn't get a seat, and I left. <laughs> <laughs> it was well, packed. but if they'd have easy, mm -hmm. you could at yeah, least dance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Yeah, we do. Uh, oh, this, Martin, you did bring up one point. Uh, where are we with the conditions that the planning department wanted? Which was? Again, we brought up a security issue. Now, mm -hmm. if it's solved by the fact that when they have live entertainment, the roll up door windows are down, and they have a complete enclosure, which they can control, mm -hmm. we wouldn't see that as a security okay. problem. Okay, so, so long as. That went to them. But when the roll up doors, windows are open up, and if they had live entertainment, we see a serious question there. Okay. Uh, haven't we done that? On, okay. Haven't we done that in the past, based off of the attendance? The, like that bar down by the casino, we said one person for every hundred or something like that. Yeah, but they're going to have that regardless of whether they have live entertainment or not. Security. No, I mean they're going to have that number of people there. So, like, if you go there any night during the week. There's going to be about how many people would you say fit in there? Yeah, but I'm saying that doesn't. To well, Martin's like, question, it doesn't solve it by having it inside. No, Martin's saying that they don't. That if we're going to require that the windows be down, that the windows and doors be closed, they don't care anymore about security. But I'm because saying, but I'm saying closed. in other instances, we. And I'm saying that that's not a concern here for two reasons. That um, a they're not asking for it anymore if the doors and windows are closed, but more importantly for the example that you brought up. So for that place, they were looking at having like musical acts um, and events um, at that space. So they were gonna be having particular things where they were gonna have this large number of people. <coughs> it wasn't they're already, say, on any particular night during the week, there might be 500 people there already. Okay. So okay. we're gonna require how many more, you know, they're going to require security for how many people above that? I'll go with whatever plan is best. Okay. <laughs> I honestly don't see the difference there, but I'll go with, I'm fine with whatever plan is best. All right. So uh, do we have the authority to, to, to take action sub, that's limited to the current owner? I, I, I don't think no, we do. I don't know. No. no. I think it runs with the it land. Goes yes, with it the does. Land. Suspect. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, our authority is zoning, and the um, and that authority really is it affects the actual piece of property, right. not yeah. a person. Right. So. So what about the? Can we carve out something that specifies that their floor plan is what we're holding them to when they have that tiny little dance area to prevent yeah. it from becoming a yes. big? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that we should. Uh, that would definitely be a change that would require a new hearing. Mm -hmm. um, on that subject, they do need to show the. Lo I think under the code, they have to show location of the band or DJ or whatever, and they just show where the dance floor is. So mm -hmm. they're going to have to submit a revised um, floor plan just showing that. But yes, they would be limited to what they've filed. So does anybody see potential for? Snowballing with people just deciding they're going to dance wherever instead of just on the dance floor. Well, that they can't. Um, that they can't necessarily right. control. Right. So people are going to um, <laughs> going to get up and uh, dance wherever they're going to be. Well, uh, okay, we're not going to say that they have to run them out of the place. But um, uh, but as far as the turning into one huge nightclub. Well, they still have the. Um, Table service, the tables, other than in that square, the, mm -hmm. the uh, drawing shows seating. And I think if they eliminate seating, 
that to change. Yeah. It also may trigger additional capacity questions from the fire department mm -hmm. about how many people can be in a space. Yeah, because yeah, they would rate it differently um, with you know a dance floor and tables and chairs and all that kind of stuff versus if you took all the tables and chairs and stuff out of there. And I, I would envision that they're going to have entertainers spread out throughout that area. They may have on one night they'll have a one person entertainer that sets up an acoustic mm -hmm. stand. Other nights they may have three or four in a group. So they, I guess they should include that in their floor plan and indicate how many entertainers would be in a given area. Mm -hmm. um, it's all very, I mean, they, I'm sure they want flexibility. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they have a trivia night, they're going to have somebody walking around with a microphone, you know. Uh, it's uh, uncharted territory. Yeah. It says they're going to have trivia night. Has anybody ever really had trivia night at one of these places? Yeah, I think they, they do. They do, they do on North okay. Avenue. Okay. My sister likes going to some, trivia nights. Some well, draw well, regular <laughs> fans. <laughs> it's kind of it's a, it's a, hip, no, it's a mm -hmm. hipster thing now. Just me. I've never been to trivia night, yeah, obviously. Yeah. They do have. <laughs> there are people who have like whole teams. Yeah, right. and she goes like <laughs> okay. she's part of a team, and like, they go to competitions and places. Okay. So, yeah, I thought that whole was hipster just, movement. Thing, all right. Yes. Okay. And it can get around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back a couple of years. Uh, so all right. are we going with the councilwoman's hours? Yes. Everybody's good with that? Yeah. I would have been good with five if everybody said in six. So. Well, I think the point is that the music's going to take out the parking, whether it's the doors are open or not open. I think Jay raised that point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the board wants the revised floor plan before we reach the resolution. Mm -hmm. As a condition, yeah. Uh, 2017 86 2027 Maryland Avenue is consent. 2017 101 17 North Chester Street. Um, I'm a yes. 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 Great. 2017 107 301 West 29th Street. Um, I am a no as to the outdoor live entertainment, but yes as to live entertainment um, being indoor with accessory outdoor table service um, with hours limited as reflected in the letter from Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark dated April 27th 2017 and offered into the record as part of the hearing um, also incorporating or um, the uh, sound um, um, ordinance limitations um, Hours, um, well, I already said hours. Um, limitation on the floor plan, uh, yes, on the dance floor area. Yes, the area, the dance floor to be limited to the area shown in the uh, floor in the uh, floor plan, floor plan that is submitted, and the revised floor plan must be submitted showing location of any live uh, of any um, uh, band or DJ. Um, the doors and windows must be closed during uh, live entertainment events. Am I missing anything? Nope, agree. Okay, agree. Also no additional security. No additional, no additional security. Um, 2017 110, 5101 through 5103 York Road. Uh, it was by consent and incorporates the MOU with the Community Association. 2017 121, 1607 Covington Street, MBS. Yes. 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 New drawings. New drawings. drawings. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that reminder. Um, 2017 122, 1130 Inner Circle. Uh, it was by consent with planning department conditions. 2017-126, 2509 Garrett Avenue uh, was postponed. 
2017-129, 2700 through 2732 May Street was postponed. 2017-134, 2237 Essex Street was postponed. 2017-135, 2239 Essex Street uh, was by consent. 2017-136, 2750 through 2760 West North Avenue was by consent and plain department conditions. 2017 137 823 Southland Wood Avenue is by consent. I mean, it was, yeah, yes, was postponed. I've got that. Uh, 2017, I was looking at the next one. 2017 138 Southeast side of Packer Street, southwest of Monroe Street was by consent. 2007, yes, with planning conditions. Um, 2017 139 606 Fulcroft Street uh, was by consent and planning department conditions. 2017-140-1300-1308 Russell Street was by consent with planning department conditions. 2017-141-101 through 115 East Wells Street was by consent with planning department conditions. 2017-144-324 South Exeter Street was by consent. 2017-146-143 uh, West Randall Street uh, was postponed. 2017-147-4502 Keswick Road was by consent. 2017-148-2000 Rock Rose Avenue. Uh, I'm a yes with planning department conditions. Yes. Yes. 2017-157-1206 Springfield Avenue was withdrawn. 2017-158-1634 North Calvert Street was by consent. And 2017-161-1700 West 41st Street was by consent. <coughs> okay. and then go get a six pack. That is a <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know what I know the other day. <laughs> 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 